Hello everybody out there. Welcome to our very first purely digital conference on Facebook Live. My name is Yeshim and I'm part of the IBM iX Studio Berlin and I'm honored to guide you through today's special show together with my colleague Dominic. Welcome as well from my side. My name is Dominic. Um, as long as I'm not doing things like this, I work as um, digital strategist and business design consultant here at IBM iX. Um, we are delighted to um, introduce you to today's topic, which is the code to responsibility. This is why we gathered uh, lots of uh, very nice speakers today. All of them will um, hold a speech for you. And after that, they are avail available like, I think, around five more minutes to answer your questions. Yes, that's right. Um, as Dominic already said, our main topic for today is uh, code to responsibility. And responsibility is playing an increasingly important role these days in society, in nature, and also in the business world. On our conference, we want to show how the combination between digitization and responsibility uh, will be the or can be the uh, positive force for human-centered and sustainable business. So let's discuss how to crack the code to responsibility. Exactly. Whom to expect? We have a lot of very nice speakers from around the globe. We have Anna Alex. She is a co-founder of Planetly and also she was founder of Outfittery from Germany. We have John Cohn. Some of you might know him. He is an IBM fellow and um, he hosts the survival show The Colony. Uh, we have, for example, Kajal Odidra. She is executive director of Change.org in UK um, and many more. So we are happy to see all of them. Yeah, really great. And um, before we start, I, um, we have um, a video message from our CCO, Daniel Simon from IBM Magix Europe. Um, so video message up. Hello everybody from the north of Germany. I can't be in Berlin right now. So that's why I have just a short station ID here. Um, two things. First, I would uh, like to thank the whole team who did um, a great job behind the scene right now and as well the last weeks to make this happen for us. It's uh, a pilot. It's the first time we're doing this kind of conference. Um, and also I want to th say thank uh, to Dominic who just jumped in to take over my uh, moderation role. And um, also I want to thank the whole leadership team in IBM who supports us here um, pretty much. And yeah, that's it. Uh, enjoy this uh, great first <laughs> iExperience experience Friday. And um, when you do me a favor, please, um, there's on the other side, choose your buttons over here within social media um, would help us to recognize um, how you like it and get a feedback in the studio. So uh, thank you with this uh, saying, um, see you soon, bye. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Daniel. Um, and I'm sure you're watching uh, the live stream right now. So greetings from here, uh, get well soon. I guess we have already our first speaker. Exactly, then. he's already online. My very first guest today is Jeremy Wade. He is CSO of IBM iX and he will talk um, about trees, technology and transformation. I can hear you good. Great to see you. Awesome. Same from my side. Jeremy, before we start, um, this morning I read on Twitter that your daughter had to go to hospital because of breathing um, problems. Is she well? Um, yes, she did. She, well, that's actually um, the presentation I'm about to give is not the presentation I was going to give. Okay. So that features in what, what I'm about to say. Okay. So, um, yeah, it's, um, it's pretty amazing. I've not slept. Hopefully mm -hmm. I look okay. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've had a lot of coffee. Okay, okay, the stage is yours now, Jeremy. Thank you. Hey, everybody, let me share my screen so we can just whip across here. So, 
Gosh, yeah, thank you so much. This is not the talk that I was expecting to give at all. You will see very shortly why exactly that was the case. Uh, we're going to talk about code and responsibility. What does that mean? Well, my original idea was that we talk about technology trees and transformation. And whilst we are going to get into that, what I also want to do is really just think about how to inspire all the conversations that you're going to see for the rest of the day. You're going to hear some phenomenal speakers. And what I want you to try and take away is how could you try and change the world for the better? Because there's not just one crisis going on at the moment. I talk a lot about climate change and people talk about the climate crisis. There's actually three crises going on at the same time. There's a crisis of the environment, there's a crisis of globalization, and there's a crisis of technology. Uh, one of my favorite writers, Tom Friedman, calls it how you've got this huge disruption in markets, Mother Nature, and Moore's Law. And it's all happening at the same time, right? And coronavirus very much with the chaos is part of globalization. So I want to talk about how do we build a business, change the world, and have fun. So what I want to do is really just start just by trying to set the scene. Let's just take a step back because this is a photograph that just completely inspires me. And I thought it'd try and set the tone a little bit. We're talking about responsibility, right? This is the most reproduced photograph of all time. This was taken on the 7th of December, 1972, the year I was born. This was the Apollo 17 mission as the spacecraft was leaving Earth. And they turned back and looked the cameras back at Earth, and it was the first time the Earth had ever been fully illuminated. The Apollo 17 mission, sun was directly behind the spaceship, and they saw this incredible blue marble as it became known. And what many people have said now, this really started the modern environmental movement. And all of a sudden you've got people starting to care about this really, really fragile little planet that we're on. And I spent a lot of time looking at this and I thought rather than just show you a slide, hopefully this is gonna work. I thought, let's just have a look at some live data because we start looking at the world and we start looking at the jet streams and what's going on with weather events. Let's see if we can it to my friends in Berlin over here, we can start looking at what's actually going on in the earth, right? So instead of looking at the air and the jet streams, what if we actually start looking at levels of CO2? So the climate scientists are talking at the moment about all of the carbon that's in the atmosphere. What you see in here, my friends, is 436 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. The reason that that number is important is because the last time we saw this much carbon in the atmosphere, According to all the scientists in the data, it was 3 million years ago when sea levels were 20 meters higher and there were beech trees growing in the Antarctic. The world's being turned literally upside down. We're seeing phenomena like this. This is an incredible photograph, isn't it? This is um, it's a wet microburst, which is a really funny name, but this was taken in Tucson, Arizona last year. This is just the rain literally in that column just bouncing off the earth. And these rain bombs, as the scientists are calling them, are just happening more and more frequently. And they, should be, they used to be just, you know, these years and years or decades between them. We're seeing events like this. The day I was training with Al Gore for his climate reality program last year, 31st of July, this is supposed to be solid ice. This was the day that 13 billion tons of ice melted off one of the glaciers in Greenland. And we're just seeing these unprecedented levels. We're seeing 19 of the 20 hottest years on record have happened since 2001. Things are not all as they seem. 7th of December this year, this is Lewis Pugh, the endurance swimmer. You may have seen this in the news just a few weeks ago. He put on his speedos, he put on his hat. Durham University with 65,000 new lakes underneath the East Antarctic ice sheet. And he decided he's gonna go and swim underneath one of them to prove a point. You are not supposed to be able to swim in Antarctic, let alone for 10 minutes. Actually went in one of the underground lakes and he swam underneath one of them. And it was the hottest day on record in the Antarctic. It was 18.3 degrees C. And yet with all of this stuff going on and the world being changed and turned upside down, this exponential growth that we're seeing on a finite planet, so many of us are just acting like it's business as usual, right? The world's just all over the place. Coronavirus, politics, technology's turning everything upside down. Doesn't need to ruin your golf game. Look at that photograph from Washington a couple of years ago. It's crazy, isn't it? And the more I think about this kind of stuff, the more I think about how could I actually make a difference? How could, and so this is the journey that I went on. And hopefully this a tiny bit of this might inspire you a little bit. I started reading a lot about 18 months ago. I thought, I wonder if this could be part of what I do on a full-time basis. 
Tom Friedman from the New York Times, Al Gore, who has Climate Reality Project. The book by IBM and the far right is actually phenomenal. But in the middle there, you've got cannibals with forks. John Elkington was arguing that if you gave a cannibal a fork, is that really progress? Whereas actually for the first time in 1997, he introduced the concept of the triple bottom line. We've got to care just as much about people, planet and profit as we do about just helping people to sell more stuff. So I just decided all of a sudden I need to do something, right? I want to do something to try and help. I started reading work from like Kate Rayworth. This is an amazing TED talk that you should check out. I'm not going to talk about it now. That's her book on the far left, Donut Economics. What happens in business if there's a shortfall and we fall within that social foundation? But maybe if we overstretch the planet and you've got the overshoot and you start to see all these extreme weather events and all the impacts of global warming. So with all of this in mind, I start digging around and I read a lot of books. Like I say, I start trying to think, well, how does that apply to IBM? Um, yeah, I know. I'm a massive geek. <laughs> like a transformational corporate design, 1945. That is genuinely my bedtime reading. But Elliot knows, who is one of the pioneers, good design is good business. With Charles and Ray Eames back in the day, and you see Paul Rand coming through later on. At the core, what IBM actually does is to help people extend control over their environment. So I started thinking about that and thinking, okay, well, how does that work? And you guys could do this when you're listening, you could draw three circles. You could think about what is it that I love? You may have seen this on Instagram or Pinterest. You could think, well, what does the world need? Because what often happens is what you love and what the world needs is not what you get paid for. And it's not often what you're spending all of your time around what you're good at. The key, I think, to happiness at work is to figure out your ikigai, the Japanese concept of finding your purpose. It's not what keeps you up at night. It's what gets you out of bed in the morning and you find where those four worlds collide. And that's exactly what I started to do. I started to try and combine the thing that I'm good at with what I get paid for, with what I love and what the world really needs. I start to explore all the way across what we've been doing. We're a 109 year old startup, right? But we've been doing phenomenal things. Turns out that some of the best kept secrets, we're not always that great at telling our own stories, right? We got six Nobel prize winners, we're putting, six or seven billion a year into research. We register in 9,000 a year patents. And you start to see all of the phenomenal stuff that IBM's doing. So I'm like, well, how can we start to build on that? Sustainability consulting and CSR studio. So I start looking at the business cases. How do we start trying to make an impact maybe with technology and code? United Nations say the sustainable development goals could generate when they built them in 2015. And then this goes through to how we fix the world by 2030, 12, trillion dollars of opportunities for these 16 sustainable development goals with the 17th as partnerships. There's an amazing app, by the way, you should absolutely check it out. SDGs in action. It's a beautiful, really nice UI. You can scroll through it on your phone, teaches you about whichever one of those goals that you'd be most passionate about, gives you case studies and all the data to be able to go and talk to your friends and your colleagues about it. So what I started to do was to think, okay, well, how do we apply this? To the work that I'm doing at IBM. You start looking at the products and services. We map them to those 17 goals. We even took all of our technology and we started to see of our technology stacks, which ones are solving which ones of the biggest problems and how could we now maybe go and apply some of this stuff. And then just like I found my Ikigai, I drew my donut, I aligned my sustainable development goals and started to look at the different projects that we were already working on. But now all of a sudden I've got a different story. I'm starting to talk about emissions and energy management, the transition to net zero. How do we wrap that around a climate story? How do we talk about the work we're doing in Copenhagen to take 60,000 tons of CO2 out of the atmosphere, smart and resilient infrastructure? How do we try and reinvent the world's food systems with companies like Unilever, farm to fork, change what people eat, try and change their diets to try and help the world to sustain the growth in the population. We've got climate risk protecting the assets of the banks and some of the big organizations that are being hit by the effects of global warming. So this is really in a nutshell, the one slider of what we started to do. So we built it. It's amazing. We built the sustainability and climate consulting practice. And then there's a garage, which is this innovation model at scale, super quick, how you can then go and innovate at speed. And it's mapped to that triple bottom line. How do we help clients innovate faster to solve a big problem based around employee happiness, the environment, and how do you make more money or save more money with the economics of it? So this 
is some pretty amazing stuff. Now, what I would have normally done is spend a whole bunch of time talking to you about all of these beautiful offerings, which would love to sell anyone that's in, but I don't want to do that. We're going to share the depths and things with you afterwards. If this was the keynote I was going to give, what I would normally do, I'd probably talk to you about technology, trees, and transformation, which is what we set up for today. And I'd show you this movie. This was built in November. We just showed it um, at length at um, Davos, World Economic Forum. We're about to launch it at Think, the extended version, which we're going to do virtually. So you can dial in and watch that. You can take a screenshot and you can see all the assets there at the bottom corner of the page. 275,000 responses from people all over the world built 2,700 apps to figure out how to try and use technology to change the way the world works. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. It's available on Amazon Prime. It's available on Apple TV, but I don't want to talk to you about that. This was a normal keynote. I would be talking to you about Mayflower, the world's first autonomous ship going to set sail in September. Solar panels, it's going to look at ocean acidification, sea level rise, mammal tracking, and it's going to look at microplastics in the ocean. On the 400th anniversary of the first Mayflower, that took the pilgrims over to the new world 400 years ago, we're going to do the same thing. 95% of the world's oceans have never been explored. There's a whole load of stuff. I encourage you to check it out. Go and Google Mayflower and IBM, and you'll see some phenomenal work with Promari. And again, if this was a normal keynote, I'd be talking to you about blockchain Beam. See the link there in the bottom corner of the page. This is quite an inspirational story. I'll give you the 30 seconds of it because you can just go into a store, Brooklyn Roasting Company in New York, using IBM blockchain technology. You can start to have a look. You've got your QR code. You take a picture of the side of the coffee cup. Not only does it show you the exact blend and flavor profile, it shows you the farmer. And it shows you the farmer itself, where it came from. You can even tip the farmer and give him some love directly from your phone, wherever you are. That does a whole bunch of things. That makes it easy to trace. It reduces fraud. It helps the farmers to get a fair price. And it helps to improve the experience of connects you exactly to where your products come from. It's called Thank Your Farmer. Again, that's a beautiful story. But what I want to spend the last few minutes talking to you about is something that happened a couple of hours ago. Like you just heard me say when we opened, I have not slept on the very important reason for that because I have twins. Um, and no, not that reason. They didn't keep me up all night crying their eyes out. They kept me up all night because my little twin, this is Matilda, at 2.56 this morning was taken into hospital. I'm going to try and keep it together and not cry my eyes out. She's taken into hospital with all sorts of things that were going wrong with her. She already had heart surgery when she was really tiny. She's struggling to breathe. She was super hot, but she's got pneumonia, blue lips, blue fingers, blue toes. She's struggling to breathe. Her stomach's coming up and down and it's pounding and her temperature's 39.4. Got a serious fever. We phone 111. We try on hold for ages. We end up phoning the ambulance and the paramedics. We end up having to go to hospital. And we end up going in and we start seeing the doctors. And this is where the technology story comes in. And before you get upset, this has got a happy ending, so it's okay. One of the things that we noticed is that when we we're in hospital, they weren't even allowed to check properly for some of the things that it could be, right? She could actually just have a fever or tonsillitis. But because of COVID, they're not allowed to check her throat. So now you start to see the space where you need technology more than ever. Feels a little bit like I'm an IBM case study. Just before they were born, we were given 0% chance of survival. I was working at Salesforce, and I'm sat here seeing the 10,000 data points a second coming off my little girl. We're still expecting her to die just after they've had heart surgery. And yet all of the data that's coming up there, the research doctors that we've been in and out for every other day for about 16 weeks, we find out she's going to survive because there's this thing called Watson that is helping to correlate all of that information with a degree of accuracy and try and help them to understand what to do next with this rare disease. This is the first time we put our twins together. This is Petra and Matilda, the first time they literally hugged. And then I gave a small presentation afterwards. I joined IBM. They recruiting me at the time. I was like, I want to work for the company that does that. This is my little girls in their Wimbledon dresses. So when I think about what's happening at the moment, and I think about COVID, I'm thinking about what we've got. I'm thinking about how technology can help. So for me, we've got the two biggest supercomputers in the world, right? The size of four football pitches. These are things are phenomenal. Wembley Stadium, which I can almost see from my house, 90,000 people at Wembley Stadium. If you took 30 Wembley stadiums 
and every single person had a MacBook Pro. That's what the computing power of this thing is. It's about 9,000 CPUs and 27,000 graphics cards. If every single human on Earth did one calculation a second for a whole year, that's what this computer can do in one second. And at IBM, we're using it to try and attract, uh, to try and attack coronavirus. So you can see the link there, thought leadership, COVID-19. That link will take you through to this page that has all of the assets on it. You can go and have a look down. We're making all of this data available to anybody, weather company data, there's design data, what's an assistant data, resources for remote learning, all sorts of interesting stuff in there that can help you out. But I wanted to tell you really what we're actually doing just in these last couple of minutes, and hopefully it will try to inspire you a little bit because I've just seen this firsthand. The US Department of Energy, there's a facility called Oak Ridge Laboratory, and it's deployed some, it's deployed our, our computer against the fight for COVID. And what's actually happening is that the researchers from Oak Ridge have been granted emergency computation time on Summit. So what they're actually doing is performing simulations with that ridiculous, unprecedented speed. And in just two days, Summit has identified and studied 77 small molecule drug potential compounds to fight against COVID-19, which is the new coronavirus. So that's a task that using the traditional wet lab approach would have taken absolutely years. So researchers are using Summit to perform all of those simulations on more than 8,000 possible compounds. They're trying to screen them, that which have got the most opportunity to impact on the disease. And then binding to the main spike protein of the coronavirus, they're then trying to render it unable to infect the host cells. So what's basically happening is they're ranking these compounds of interest that could have value in experimental studies of the virus. And all these computer simulations trying to examine how different variables are going to react with different viruses. So each of these can comprise billions of unique data points. So when you start seeing the computing power of things like this and the power of big data, looking at the accuracy and the confidence that we can have to be able to do this at scale, you start to see that with multiple simulations, this is an incredibly time intensive process that traditional computing just wouldn't have been able to do. It's the main reason we're investing so much money in quantum that most of any company in the world, even though we don't properly know what to do with it yet, we know that this is gonna be a key part in a few years time. So even though that we've got some way to go, scientists are hoping that the computational findings that are gonna inform future studies around coronavirus, and it's gonna provide this framework for the way that laboratories are able to further investigate these compounds. And only then, we're going to know if you've got the needed correct characteristics to be able to attack and kill this virus. But it's certainly fair to say, right, that we're helping to shrink the front end part of this process against the conventional methods that you would have had. So that just inspires me. I start to think about the work we're doing across things that are not able to be cured. You know, I've worked with Memorial Sloan Kettering and Oncology, type 1 diabetes that we're doing with John Hopkins, not able to find a cure yet. They're using this type of technology. And I don't know if you've come across this yet, but you can start to see the John Hopkins data model. They've made all of this data available on GitHub, that everything is available there for everyone to be able to get access to it. We can go in and we can start seeing real time the data. We can see what's going on and the daily increases. And we can start to try and understand what's going on in order to try and use technology to fix it. So with that in mind, I just want to say, um, Thank you. We ran a big campaign last year, and it was called Dear Tech, and it was about trust and transparency and ethics and privacy. And I'm going to try and not cry. We asked people to ask what Dear Tech, what they would ask technology. Come on, Jeremy. I don't want to ask it anything. What I want to do is I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you for the way that, as Gary Kasparov says, good humans and machines, when they come together, they can do magical things. And you've got to have that combination. And I think that's the responsibility we've got when we look at code, right? When we look at the responsibility that we have, on its own, technology is nothing. It does amazing things. What's actually important is that we have faith in people, especially the healthcare workers, and that they're good and they're smart. And if you give them the right tools, like Summit and Watson and all the work we do across Aperto and IX, hopefully we'll do something wonderful with them. So thank you so much for listening. I hope this has inspired you in some tiny way. 
to go and change the world. And I look forward to hearing what everybody else has got to say and what you guys get up to next. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Jeremy, very much from my side as well. And I'm pretty sure that, that it was very inspiring for every one of, of us. I can see the first comments in the, ca in, in the camera uh, on the screen out there. Um, people are giving you props for coming on to this and wishing you good luck for, for your daughters. Um, that was amazing to hear uh, everything. She's downstairs, by the way. She's not in hospital. She's downstairs ah, on the sofa. Perfect. They've given her some drugs. She's tired but she's happy and healthy Perfect. and they said she's probably got she's going to be okay but very nice it's, it's, it's scary isn't it scary it stuff. Is scary but uh, i have one question for you from from the audience out there um there's someone asking you um what is your personal advice for people who um who are overwhelmed by crisis like this do you have any any idea what you can tell them um well i'm definitely one of those people <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and all I can say is that what I've done is um, I'm very noisy on social media. I use Twitter and LinkedIn a lot. Um, I've deleted them from all my mobile devices. I only check Twitter once a day. I'm on LinkedIn probably once a day. I'm only checking the news from one source once a day, which I'm using the BBC. And I'm just trying to get, whilst there is a lot of positive energy going on on social media, <laughs> nonsense. Mm -hmm. And I've taken the time to spend more time with my family more time reading and certainly I'm going out, of, I've even stopped drinking. I'm going out and trying to ride my bike and just trying to spend more time outside thinking about more stuff because we're in an echo chamber. And I think this gives us an opportunity to take a step back, look at that process of Ikigai and think, what am I actually doing? How can I combine what I love with what I'm good at, with what I get paid for and what the world needs. And I think if yeah. that for you is drawing, making sense in a notebook, reading some yeah. new stuff you've never read before. I would make mm -hmm. every opportunity while you're at home of doing that. And thinking of the situation, um, do you still, or do you personally still have any concrete milestones for the year regarding um, sustainability? The milestones, are, well, two of them for us are for the, first of all, for the practice. Um, I think it's one of the best kept secrets we have. Um, and I mean, if I'm not being, being candid, we spend a huge amount of money on research. We don't actually spend that much money on marketing. What that often means is all these incredible stories that we sat on and I shared a few of them today, a lot of people don't know about them. So the milestones for me for the end of the year is just to try and share with as many people as possible some of the stories that we've got so that they get access to yeah. that technology and they can then use those open source tools, go and play with them themselves. Yeah. So I just want to see more people playing with it in order to go and do more good stuff. Call for Code is a great place to start. Go and check out the movie Code and Response. Okay. Jeremy, thank you very much. Greetings also from my side. Greetings from my colleague, Yezim, and um, <laughs> we wish you all the best from here, from Berlin. No bye comment. Bye. Congratulations on putting it on. Really appreciate it. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. So, Dominic, do you realize that we are really doing this like having our first digital conference. Of course. <laughs> it's of course. crazy. <laughs> so we had a lot of time working on that, but uh, now we are really happy that we can be here. And um, our next guest is waiting in the line, uh, but first we want to see her video. Janet Cusco. <laughs> Hi, Janet. Hello. Do you hear me? Hi, everyone. Yes, I hear you. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, great to have you. You are our second speaker today. And for all of you who don't know um, Janet Gusko yet, uh, she is Senior Regional uh, Manager DACH at uh, GoFundMe. And her topic um, is Digitalization for a Common Good. Um, Janet, the virtual stage is yours. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I'm very, very happy to be here. And I want to tell you about my last weekend. So together with more than 45,000 people, I participated in the biggest online hackathon the world has seen so far. The We versus Virus hack was initiated by the German government and seven civil society organizations. 
it was a huge undertaking. At times we had to be patient, at times it was messy, some things didn't immediately work. I mean, imagine setting up a Slack workspace for that many people. But this is not how I will remember that weekend. I remember the strong vision that we all shared. And that was, how will we, the people, tackle that unprecedented corona crisis? How do we support each other? How do we support the vulnerable, the elderly, the local shops? How might we improve COVID-19 testing, administration processes, or medical supply chains? So this strong vision offered such a clear path that participants followed along and self-organized. They generously shared their experience and skills. They shared power. All of this happened at a time when we were debating uh, a global tech clash. So the ongoing discussion about what technology and digitalization can really offer to the world. In those 48 hours from Friday night to Sunday night, you could see very clearly what works, what solves problems, what is important. 1,500 MVPs were built. It was like a bit of a reality check that the tech community and the commercial business community needs. An invitation to change perspective, to really address people's needs, and to find solutions for sustainable change. My name is Jeanette Gusko. I am a political campaign manager, a gender equality advocate, and a social impact strategist. I have been working for the past 10 years in tech. Um, I currently lead the DAG operations at GoFundMe. That's the world's leading social fundraising platform. I support the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy and Fundraising and Strategy. And I am the speaker for the network for the interests of the third generation of East Germans. So my reflections about uh, last weekend, about the we versus virus hackathon, really brings me to the first principle that I want to share with you for digitalization for the common good. And with that, I will share some slides. Give me a second. Voila, can you see them? Perfect, thanks. So the first principle I want to share is start with why. To serve and enhance the common good, you have to start any digital endeavor by asking why. Don't fall in love with your idea because it might change in the process. Don't fall in love with the technology, with the method, with the format, because that is more often than not the easiest part. Instead, fall in love with a social problem you want to solve. Dig really deep into why this is important. Don't take the convenient shortcut. Put who you are serving and their needs, their perspectives, their access at the center of your work. Ask questions about things that everyone else accepts. For instance, the uh, We versus Virus Hackathon team that I mentored did not accept that people seeking psychological support need to wait weeks for an appointment. What was a shortcoming in our health system before uh, during the corona crisis became an urgent injustice that needed to be fixed. So the team hacked an application called Ayuto. There, individuals seeking help can connect with psychologists and certified coaches quickly with the help of online tools. Because once you dig deeper into a challenge, your focus guides your attention, the attention of your team, of your resources, and of your volunteers. Your why creates important context for the community you want to address, for potential allies and investors. When tech follows humans, you are set up for success to make a real difference in people's lives. The second principle is to be relentless about testing. There are many reasons why testing beats meetings and theoretical analysis when deciding about the next steps of your social impact project. We are psychologically primed to think that we know best because of our knowledge, because of our research, 
because of our experience. Yet our assumptions about our target group's routines, our project's impact or other process variables are likely to fall short in reality. So making space, making time and making funds available for experimentation is key. By testing, you experience the value of your idea firsthand and your team can iterate the model over and over again in a safe space. Testing also makes your intention transparent to your community and to champions. Champions are the people who get it when others don't or when others don't want to. They are the yaysayers in this whole big sea of naysayers. You really want them, you need them. If you give champions uh, an opportunity to contribute and to co-create, they are better equipped to then later on involve their company in a potential rollout. Testing early and often also goes for highly regulated social challenges. You are likely to tackle a problem faster, uh, more inclusive of perspectives, rights preserving, privacy enhancing and people centric when you involve regulators, policymakers and public officials early on. Public innovation funds like Citra in Finland and Nesta in the UK successfully developed and implemented that approach. They are a major contributor to social tech solutions and their wide adoption in both countries. And finally, rapidly testing your prototype gets you closer to the one question of radical candor in social tech. Is your approach the real solution to the problem? The third principle I call master the quick fixes and the meta system change. There are two good news I want to share. The first piece of good news about social problems is that they are caused by decisions that humans took in the past. That means human can change those decisions again by simplifying processes, by better policy making, by campaigning, or by offering future alternatives. Future is not set in stone. It is shaped and created by the narratives, by um, the tech products and services we are creating right now. And the second piece of good news about the common good is that it can be increased by the indefinite. So in case you're wondering, there is enough for all of us to do. One way to scale solution during or after testing is by rethinking your own platform. Should it really be you to continue that path as an initiator or are other people, affected communities, marginalized voices, more diverse and better equipped? Would you be more effective as a collaboration partner or as an investor instead? Does your approach give members of the community the opportunity to partake, to engage uh, inclusively and self-determined? Innovation can really come from anywhere, from citizens, uh, from children, from volunteers at the fire brigade, um, or really unexpected places. Open up your processes and actively reach out to respective communities. Lift them up. So at GoFundMe, the place where I currently work, uh, more than 6 billion US dollars have been raised since the platform launched in 2010. That's huge. At GoFundMe DACH, we keep thinking about how we can serve our community, our users better every day. And we, for instance, saw that single mothers struggle more than others to raise money for their needs. Together with Lead Academy's Impact X program, we analyzed over 60 fundraising campaigns and conducted qualitative deep dive interviews with single moms. We listened. We learned that constraining factors of that group include that they feel shame about sharing their worries with others, that they have less financial means and um, little time uh, available after uh, care work and their paid work is done. But the one factor, their individual campaigns often uh, did not take off, like the one factor why they didn't take off was a lack of trusted network to share the campaign with. So my team and I then together um, with members with single moms researched parents' communities online, 
potential allies. We intensified trusted press um, outreaches. We developed a how to blog article for the community with members of the community and adapted our personal coaching. As a result, we saw 70% increase of fundraisers raising money. We co-created and mastered the individual case. We then uh, took one step back and understood the meta structural issues that single mothers face. Now, three political action groups tackling, for example, the communal shortage of kindergarten places and unjust taxation, um, those groups are now fundraising on the site. So if we open a room of power, like access to funds for frontline communities, we create common good as they become stronger advocates, mobilizing for political change. So to develop digitalization from an elite project that only the few can access and shape to a societal project that everyone can contribute to, leaders need to implement three things. One, a mindset shift from a technology focus to a problem solving focus. Two, a systemic and systematic testing environment. And three, a holistic approach to aim for system change. So when I was invited to come here to I Experience Friday first edition, I really thought about what is it that drives me personally. And um, it is that I want to build a future that belongs to everyone. To work towards a more just world, digitalization needs to be something every can, everyone can do, everyone can participate in. The corona crisis is a test of character. So let's use this moment of standstill that we are all experiencing to move forward stronger and more inclusive than we have done ever before. Thank you so much. Jeanette, so, so much. Yeah, great ideas, good suggestions. I really like this uh, future that belongs to everyone part. Really great. And um, I have a question, actually. Um, as you engage as a mentor for women, what is a piece of advice you could give our female viewers for their career? So um, what we see worldwide uh, that there is no uh, place where men uh, and women have equal opportunity at the moment. So um, what I would advise is to take a bit of a change in perspective, which is what can organizations, institutions uh, and allies, for example, men and male bosses, what can they do to um, widen the room for Minerva to make, to create more opportunities for women to thrive? And um, so I think once we change that perspective and take kind of the, um, the all of the responsibility and all of the work um, off the shoulders of those who are trying and who are contributing already of women, then I think we will see um, lots more to be done in the future. Okay, so before I go ahead with the questions, um, can I ask you to put you on full screen again? So you're still sharing your screen? Mm. Okay. Can you um, see me now? Uh, I just I, I, I see um, the slides. I just see mm. you in a in a little small window. Small window. Like yeah. This. yeah. Yes. Here you are. <laughs> Hi <Sure>. again. <laughs> um, please tell us which com which campaign impressed you the most. Mm. I mean, there are so many on the site. We have about 10,000 fundraising campaigns that are started every day. Uh, currently, even more, even more so, because there is this big crisis that is affecting everyone in different ways, of course. And so um, the one that I mentioned of single mothers um, um, fundraising to organize politically and um, to lobby on uh, a more or for a more just uh, taxation, I think this is a really um, impressive one. Um, Obviously, uh, what the world needs right now as well is answers on the structural um, uh, uh, injustice um, of, of climate change. And um, what impressed me last year um, a lot is um, the movement that we all know by now, Fridays for Future, 
They've been fundraising um, since March last year on GoFundMe. And what I loved is how they, um, pupils, uh, students, uh, teenagers themselves, were really stepping up and raising over 100,000 euros uh, in Germany alone. And then all over GoFundMe, all over the world, that was beautiful to see, the online collaboration, the offline taking the streets, and hopefully we will see more legislation to follow. Great. And um, how is the Ayuto project going to continue? So that's really interesting. After because, the hackathon. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because it's, it's, it's very interesting because you have the hackathon, which is kind of a limited time um, um, window. And then the question is, okay, how do we sustainably go from here? And um, at the moment, um, the Ayuto team is reaching out to psychologists um, and certified coaches on one hand, and also thinking about data protection, data security, how um, you know, that um, uh, site is going to protect um, all of that to make it a sustainable solution. And um, out of these 1,500 MVPs that I mentioned, and quite a few other projects were focusing on mental health. So one of the aspects that I mentioned um, in, the, um, in the second principle is really, is it better to collaborate? Who else is out there? Because in the end, you want to solve the problem. So they are looking now also for other projects to probably um, put the code together and kind of see how they can come along um, stronger with, um, with other groups that have been working on similar issues. Wonderful, great. Yeah, we're super excited um, to hear more about that for sure. And um, Jeanette, it was really, really great to have you here with us virtually. <laughs> thank you so much. And I hope that we see each other soon. And um, yeah, thank you for participating. Bye bye. Same. Have a good day, everyone. Enjoy. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Yeah, <laughs> so this was uh, Jeanette Gusko. Um, and for all of you who are fans of John Cohen, here's a little teaser for you. I'm John Cohen, the IBM fellow at the MIT IBM Watson AI Lab. Did you know that training a big AI model can emit more carbon than five cars do in their entire lifetime? Come hear my talk at Experience Friday, and I'll tell you about a path towards green AI. Dominic, have you seen those glasses? They're really great. Um, I yeah, would I love to they, have they, them. They would fit my beard, I think, as uh, you can see. It's, uh, they're uh, bearded, yeah. bearded, uh, yeah. Yeah. It, it would fit you, yes, would, but yes. I guess it would still be also cool with me. <laughs> uh, wonderful. Um, we will switch to our very next speaker. Um, she just uh, came online, so um, um, I am Pleased to welcome Kajal Udidra. Kajal, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Please excuse me if uh, the pronunciation of your name wasn't perfect or, or something. Was it right? That's okay. So it's, it's, it's Kajal. Thank Kajal. you though for Kajal. checking. Kajal. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Kajal, you will, talk, you will talk about digital activism in a global pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay. Thank you very much. The stage is yours now. Great. So yeah, I want to talk to you today about digital. Oh, let, let me just show, I, sorry, I've just realized I need to share my um, slides. One second. Um, can we help you? Is everything fine? Um, I think we're, I'm okay. I just, um, just had them ready. Sorry about this. No worries. Um, uh, sorry, I just had had it one moment ago. There you go, I've got them. Wonderful. Yeah. 
Okay, can you see them? Yeah, great. Um, so, yeah, I want to talk to you today about digital activism, why it matters for society and businesses, particularly during a global pan pandemic. First of all, I'll talk to you a little bit about Change.org and who I am. So I'm Kajol Odedra, the UK director of Change.org. Um, we are the world's biggest petition platform. We have over 200 million users globally and um, over 17 million users in the UK. We're a platform for creating change. So rather than, an, we're, we are not an advocacy organization ourselves, we're a platform where anyone can come along and start a petition to create the change they, need to, they want to see. Um, we see a huge variety of campaigns started on the site from national to global to hyper-local. Everything started from culture to economics and sport. And those people coming to our platform are winning. So in the UK, we're seeing around 50 campaigns winning a month. We see one win an hour globally. Change.org has been around um, for globally for around 10 years, and we grew exponentially in a really short space of time alongside the rise of, the, of social media. We came along when activism really sat in the hands of NGOs, politicians, and unions. So by giving ordinary people the best campaigning tools, the kind of tools that were, were only really available to those um, NGOs and unions, we were actively disrupting the status quo and where power lies in society. So we've been a big part of the shift in the way power works in countries around the world. Starting a petition on change.org can really get you face to face with the most powerful decision makers um, in your country. So in the last month, we've seen a huge spike in petitions started and signed on the platform. Because really in a time of life-threatening crisis, digital activism is more important than ever. Campaigners don't have the option to organize meetings and protests. They can't doorstop a politician. In a time of physical isolation, online connections are what bring us together. So we're seeing more people turn to change.org to help one another through this crisis than ever before by signing, starting and winning petitions to try and turn the tide on the outbreak. Um, some stats for you. So in the last month since the outbreak began, um, we've seen the number of petitions started on our site 7x. We've seen 25 million signatures be, being signed on our platform every week. And 90% of those petitions are COVID related. So this is really an incredibly important time for people power and digital activism. Millions of people are turning to the platform to make sure that no one is left behind. I think in a fast paced environment, you can't rely on politicians to spot all the problems with the dramatic changes that are happening to our daily lives. People are falling through the cracks. So that's why digital activism is critical right now. Petitions give ordinary people a voice to tell their story, shine a light, and find the people to help fix it. And it's working. So I want to tell you about a campaign that was a huge victory just yesterday in the UK. So hospital car parking charges have been a problem in the UK for a long time. It hasn't seemed fair to patients and hospital staff that private firms make money from people needing to visit their loved ones who aren't well, not to mention the staff who have to go, who have no choice but to use the car parks every day to go to their place of work. Um, and these are private companies making millions and millions of pounds from um, owning the car parks in the hospitals. The average cost to park in a hospital for one week is 53 pounds. And in some places it's more. So that means an NHS staff member on low wages would have to fork out, on average, £200 a month just to park their car. The coronavirus situation has catalyzed this, where you basically have health workers who are the frontline people fighting the crisis on our behalf, and they were still having to pay around £200 a month just to get to the place of work. Um, so a doctor, Andrew, started a petition called calling on the government to scrap the car parking charges for staff. On Tuesday, the petition went viral, grew to over 400,000 signatures. The media started reporting it. Um, Twitter was going ablaze, talking about car parking charges. 
often these issues that exist in society are things that pe most people don't even realize or didn't know about. And so a petition like this can draw attention to, some, to an injustice. And it might sound small, car parking charges, but these injustices mean a lot, both financially and socially and philosophically for these people that are using the hospitals. So then just yesterday morning, the government press released that all NHS staff would be able to park for free during the COVID crisis. Um, this was a victory within just a couple of days and the media are all putting it down to this big campaign that went viral. So we're seeing so many campaigns like this, big and small, that affect people on the ground and they're winning. So where do businesses fit into this? Well, customers care more than ever about corporates doing good. The Edelman, Edelman Trust Barometer found, has found that people are consuming based on values more than ever across all demographics. So it used to be the, you know, the middle-aged um, female consumer that was picking their, um, corp you know, wh where they shopped based on their values, but now it is across all demographics. Um, so companies are growingly needing to show that they stand for something. And in a global pandemic, business as usual is just not an option. You know, society is filled with crisis and fear. All people want to read about right now is COVID because there is a life-threatening level of uncertainty. Um, and quite frankly, no business can function as it usually would right now because of the restrictions in society. So I'm going to tell you three ways that businesses can engage in activism right now. Firstly, we're seeing public and employees start petitions targeting businesses to do better at this time. So when Costa Coffee, it's a um, big coffee chain in the UK, stayed open during when the outbreak began, when many other coffee um, chains and shops were starting to close, staff raised concerns to their management. They were ignored. You know, these staff were on the front line handing over the cups of coffee to the customers, putting their lives at risk. Um, and um, they were being ignored. So they started a petition to push the coffee chain to close. After thousands signed the petition, Costa responded and announced it would close within um, five days ago. Next up, Treat Well, which is the largest hair and beauty bookings website in, the, in Europe, realized they couldn't put out their usual content on their channels without looking tone deaf. They knew businesses that they work with were being impacted, and so were customers. So they decided to step up and advocate for their, for their businesses. They started a petition on change.org themselves for the government to give economic hardship relief to the hair and beauty industry and support UK salons. That petition has grown to over 100,000 signatures. It's being shared by beauty influencers on social media and being covered in women's magazines. Treat Well is really setting itself apart as one of the good guys here. And then thirdly, when stores came out, when stories were coming out on the front of frontline staff in the US and, and Europe working without masks and the governments weren't able to keep up, weren't able to solve the problem fast enough, Apple stepped up. So the Apple CEO Tim Cook tweeted last Saturday that the company was going to donate million, millions of masks for health professionals in the US and Europe to help combat the spread of the virus. Apple's operations team is using its supply chain knowledge to source, procure, and donate the masks. My point here is that businesses can and should be doing more to fix society. People realize that government isn't the only source of power in society, and that with social media, we now have a window into a company's affairs like we've never had before, and the ability to shame them for bad behavior. What's more, these companies leverage a lot of power in society to help solve government's problems. This global pandemic is becoming a real stress test for businesses. How they respond to the challenges in front of them will be a defining moment. Everything from their response to consumers to how flexible and supportive they are being with their staff. And these are just three of the ways that we're seeing businesses respond on our platform. Thank you. Um, may I ask you before I, I, have, um, I um, let you know my questions, may I ask you to go full screen again so we can see? Yes, I'll just do that now. Perfect, wonderful. 
Um, according to what you just uh, talked about, do you think people become more selfish or um, more generous during those uh, during these times? Um, yes, it's interesting you say that. I was just um, tweeting on social media yesterday that though we are physically isolated from each other, I have found that society is becoming more and more connected than ever before. I genuinely believe that in a time of crisis, um, when the chips are down, humanity shows the best of itself. I've seen the same thing during terror crises. So a few years ago, we had a spate of terror attacks in the UK. It was a really, really difficult time for society. We also had the tragic Grenfell fire and um, society was being hammered, you know, um, at the, in its heart. And rather than turning against each other, we were seeing people start petitions for solidarity and calling for, you know, the unsung hero of the attacks to be, you know, celebrated. So, yeah, I really see yesterday in the UK at 8 p.m., you know, everybody clapped for the NHS. So I was, you know, in my home expecting British people to be very awkward and not do this, but everybody opened their windows and doors and just started clapping mm -hmm. out of nowhere. Yeah. It was incredible. Yeah, yeah, exactly. How did your, did your team adjust to the situation? Yeah, we actually were, um, we responded very fast. So we, we switched to working from home uh, two and a half weeks ago. We've um, uh, made sure that all of our staff have um, uh, office equipment at home. We are, we've rolled out mental health support for all staff and um, are, you know, just being very, very supportive to parents. You know, you cannot expect any parent right now to, to be able to work at 100% when if the schools are closed in their country, they are doing two jobs, essentially. Mm. And um, so we are just not expecting what we would usually expect from parents as well. And I think, you know, organisations that are tech based are able to respond a lot faster But what I think is fascinating right now is that organizations that thought that they could never do this because they were steeped in bureaucracy. So I'm on the board for um, Save the Children, which is an um, international NGO. They're actually finding that they can quickly, they're, they're, they're adapting quicker than they, than they thought that they could have done. That actually, you know, making those um, adjustments, aren't, that it's not as stressful and uh, chaotic for the company as they, as they might have thought. So uh, one more thing to our viewers out there. Um, if you have any more questions or concerns or anything to tell us, just let us know in the comment section. Um, our community team working remote is working with them and they will send them over to us. Um, Kajil, uh, thank you very much for the insights. It was very nice uh, speaking to you and I hope you have a good rest of the day. Thank you so much for having me. Take care. Bye-bye. Oh, that was Kajal. Exactly. Great. Um, actually, um, I have a next guest, but he is not uh, in my WebEx right now. So I guess we can uh, really ask people to um, post more questions. And um, don't be shy, just uh, write everything you want to know, ask the questions you wanted to ask our um, speakers. And um, yeah, just go ahead. And if you are interested what's going next or what will happen in the agenda, you can also find that below in our <coughs> Facebook event page. So uh, just have a look. There are various interesting speakers uh, in the line. So yeah, um, Dominic. Um, maybe one more thing for everyone okay. who just joined us recently. We, uh, we are talking live on uh, Facebook now about the code of responsibility. We have um, very nice speakers, interesting speakers from all around the world, from Norway, from Israel, um, Germany, UK, US. Um, and hopefully our next guest will be there soon as well. Yeah, I hope so too. Um, he wanted to join us from Tel Aviv. <laughs> So uh, let's see, I guess um, he needs just a few minutes more. Um, but um, as we are waiting, uh, we can maybe talk. Um, oh, he just joined. <laughs> nice. So as I told you, our next guest is from Tel Aviv and his specialty is um, our debates. Why is that? Let's have a look. <laughs> Thank you.
Here we are. So we are live, Noam. Great to have you here, and uh, great that you're um, uh, that you're participating. Um, very nice. So you are live at the moment. Everyone can see you out there. <laughs> Hi, hello, everybody. <laughs> Pleasure joining this uh, special and unique event. Thank you for allow me to participate yeah and we are really excited about your topic uh, we will talk about the project debater and um, mm -hmm. the virtual stage is yours go ahead okay thank you very much so let me start sharing the presentation just a second So, can you hear, can you see my uh, slides? Okay, fantastic. So, uh, uh, in IBM Research, uh, we have this uh, interesting uh, tradition of gun challenges in artificial intelligence. Back in the 90s, IBM introduced Deep Blue that was able to defeat Gary Kasparov in chess. And uh, uh, in 2011, IBM introduced uh, Watson that uh, was able to defeat the all-time winners of the TV trivia game uh, Jeopardy. And just a few days after this uh, event, an email was sent uh, to all the thousands of researchers in IBM that we have across the globe asking us what should be the next grand challenge for uh, IBM research. I was intrigued by that, so I offered my office mate at the time to brainstorm together, and this is what we did. We sat in the office in Tel Aviv, and we raised many different ideas that I will most definitely not going to share with you today. But at some point towards the end of the meeting, I suggested this notion of developing a machine that will be able to debate humans and that this is how we will demonstrate the technology through a full live debate between this envisioned system and an expert human debater. This sounded better than all the other thoughts that we had up to that moment. So we decided to submit that and the only guidance that we got from the management was to submit it in a single slide so they will not be swamped with too many details. And we were able to follow these guidance and we submitted a single slide. Uh, uh, this was back in February 2011. This started a fairly long and thorough review, review process that lasted for a year. And eventually in February 2012, this proposal was selected as the next grand challenge for IBM research. We started to work just a few months after that with a small team that gradually expanded. And after, I would say, more than six and a half years of intensive work dedicated solely to this uh, mission of developing a machine that will be able to debate humans, we demonstrated the system for the first time in an event held in San Francisco about a year ago. And it was a full live debate between this system now being called Project Debater and one of the legendary debaters in the history of university debate competitions, Mr. Harish Natarajan. And it was surprisingly reminiscent to the vision that we had back in the office in Tel Aviv in that single slide quite a few years earlier. And, and this was in front of, uh, of a live audience of uh, about 800 people. Uh, mainly journalists from all the top uh, media outlets, and it was broadcasted live on the internet, and it received massive media exposure, around 2.1 billion uh, social media impressions, a lot of video views. Actually, uh, a documentary movie was produced uh, uh, to document uh, uh, the journey that we had over the years, and the uh, premiere of this movie is going to happen next week uh, virtually in Copenhagen in a film festival. And uh, what we are going to do next is really uh, we're going to share with you just uh, three minutes out of this uh, out of this debate. Uh, the full live debate is available uh, on YouTube. And uh, after that, we will talk about how the system actually works. But before sharing the video, uh, here is the premise. The debate starts with, uh, with a motion. In this case, it was whether or not uh, we, that is the government, should subsidize uh, preschools. There are many considerations around how this motion is being selected, uh, which I'm omitting now. Uh, uh, but I will emphasize that obviously it is selected from a list of topics uh, that were never used 
uh, in the training data of the system. So the system was never trained on this particular topic. Uh, we are on site government, so Project Debater supports the motion. Harish is on the opposition. Uh, we have four minutes opening speeches for each side, uh, four minutes uh, rebuttal speeches, and two minutes of closing statements. So all in all, clauses included, we are talking about nearly 25 minutes of a discussion between man and machine. We will now see just uh, three minutes a video out of this debate. And, and then we're going to talk about the underlying technology and the implications of this technology. So let's play the video, please. Greetings, Harish. I have heard you hold the world record in debate competition wins against humans, but I suspect you've never debated a machine. Welcome to the future. <laughs> when we subsidize preschools and the like, we are making good use of government money because they carry benefits for society as a whole. For decades, research has demonstrated that high quality preschool is one of the best investments of public dollars, resulting in children who fare better on tests and have more successful lives than those without the same access. Secondly, a few words about poverty. While I cannot experience poverty directly and have no complaints concerning my own standards of living, <laughs> I still have the following to share. Regarding poverty, research clearly shows that a good preschool can help kids overcome the disadvantages often associated with poverty. The OECD has recommended that government subsidize pre-primary education to boost performance in poorer areas. Well, thank you very much, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here for this historic event. And it certainly was a pleasure to listen to Project Debater. There was a lot of information in that speech and lots of facts and lots of figures. The problem, though, is the reality of subsidizing preschools is one which does not deal with the underlying problems in society. If you massively increase the number of people going to preschool, they are all going to be the ones going to the high-quality preschools. In a competitive environment at the age of three or four, when you're learning that, you are, you're, that that other child is potentially better than you, when you realize you aren't necessarily as talented as someone else, that huge psychological damage for many children may not even may mean that preschool is actively harmful. Among other things, I think Mr. Natarajan suggested that preschools should not be subsidized because this will reduce their quality. I would like to offer a different view. I disagree with my opponent. Subsidizing preschools will have no negative effect on their quality. If anything, the opposite is true. One of many reasons is that subsidizing attracts more skilled and qualified people to the field, improving the quality of preschools for all. My opponent claimed that preschools are harmful. I believe my argument suggested that the benefits outweigh the potential disadvantages. I touched upon three issues, children, students, and crime. Specifically, I noted that preschool education improves children's development. In addition, I suggested that attending preschool helps students succeed. And a final point to consider is that preschool can prevent future crime. We should subsidize preschools. Thanks for your attention. Okay, so... Uh... As mentioned, the full live uh, debate is uh, available on YouTube. And I think a fair question at this stage is how this system actually works. The short answer is given in this slide, which is obviously too detailed uh, uh, to cover in this meeting. But I will try to take you at the high level. The system has two major sources of information. One of them is a massive collection of around 400 million newspaper articles. And when the debate starts, the system is using various AI engines trying to pinpoint within this massive And after finding these short pieces of text, the system is trying to use other AI engines in order to glue them together into a meaningful narrative. And this is really a formidable challenge to be able to identify the correct text and then generate a narrative out of that. The second major source of information for the system is a massive collection of more principled 
argumentative elements, thousands of argument, principal argumentative elements that we authored, we created over the years. And this is kind of a unique knowledge graph. And when the debate starts, the system is navigating in the right timing. And let me give you an example of what we mean by a principal argumentative element. So if we are debating whether or not to ban the sale of alcohol or whether or not to ban organ trade, in both cases, the opposition may say that if we ban something, we are at the risk of the emergence of a black market. So, and this by itself has a lot of negative implications. So a black market is a principled argument that can be used similarly in many different contexts. One may naively assume that this is just a keyword matching thing. So if we uh, ban something, the opposition might use the black market argument. This is, of course, not the case. So for example, if we have a debate on banning uh, breastfeeding in public, a debate about banning internet cookies, we're probably not going to see a black market of internet cookies emerging due to this ban. So the system needs to develop a more subtle understanding of the human language in order to perform well in this task. Finally, there is rebuttal. We need somehow to respond to the opponent. And this starts by understanding the words articulated by the human debater. For that purpose, we use uh, Watson speech recognition capabilities out of the box. But of course, we need to go beyond the words and understand the gist of the, of the speech by the human opponent in order to respond accordingly. And in order to do that, we develop several techniques. Many of them rely on the same principle of trying to anticipate in advance what kind of arguments the opposition might use and then listen and, and determine whether indeed the opposition was making this argument in order to respond accordingly. So this is at a high level how the system operates. Taking a step back, we needed to develop three unique uh, capabilities. The first one is data-driven speech writing and delivery. Think about the opening speech of the system. This is a four minute speech around 700 words. Reminiscent to an opinion article that you may read in, in the newspaper, but this one was written by the system in a completely automatic manner on a topic it was never trained upon before. So this is quite challenging. The second capability is uh, listening comprehension uh, in analogy to reading uh, comprehension. So let's compare that to the personal assistance, personal AI assistance that we are familiar with in our smartphone. These are often uh, uh, powered by quite effective and impressive AI capabilities, but these personal assistants need to handle, usually to understand a single sentence with a functional flavor, like find me a restaurant nearby or turn off the lights. Debater is in a completely different scenario. It needs to listen to the opponent. The opponent is speaking fast with a lot of emotions for several minutes, raising ethical considerations and moral dilemma. And still we need to understand the gist of that and respond, which is quite challenging. And finally, there is the issue of modeling human dilemmas that is trying to formalize and capture the commonalities between the many different debates that humans are having through this notion of principal arguments that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and of course, the problem is that many, many things need to succeed simultaneously in order for the system uh, to perform well in this task. And many things can go wrong, which I do not have time to share with you today. But over the years, we were able to make progress. Uh, we started to do the first live debates in 2016. So this is four years after we started to work. And the system was more or less at a toddler level, not making a lot of sense. But in just three years, the system made it to, uh, uh, to the level of a decent university debate. So this was quite interesting uh, to see. Now, what happened since the demonstration in February, about a year ago in San Francisco, uh, all these projects should be perceived as part of the general journey of IBM research to develop technologies that will eventually enable us to master human language. And the, t and the mission of the debater team as part of that is to develop language technologies that will allow to enhance decision-making in enterprises. So when we need to take a decision, 
this means that we are facing a complex question, a question that do not have a simple factual answer, rather what it has are pros and cons that need to be carefully considered. So what do people do when they face such a scenario? One possibility is to read, go ahead and read the relevant material and search for arguments there. And I already mentioned the technologies that we developed in this context. The other option is to listen and consult, consult with your friends, consult with your families and with your peers, ask them to share their opinions and their arguments. And with that in mind, we posed this question, what will happen if we will present a controversial topic in front of thousands of people and ask them to contribute arguments? Can we generate, can we use debater technology, generate compelling narratives out of all these individual contributions coming from thousands of people? So we call that a debater speech by crowd. And uh, what are the challenges in order to do that? You need to automatically understand if an argument is supporting or, or contesting the topic. We need somehow to remove redundancy because different people will contribute the same point or be using different words. We need to automatically identify the underlying themes that spontaneously emerge from all these individual contributions. And finally, we need to automatically capture this vague but highly important notion of argument quality. Often when you show people two arguments, they will agree that one is better than the other. But what are the underlying mechanisms that guide us to prefer one argument over the other? And how do you train an AI system to capture this notion? This is the kind of challenges that we needed to address in this context. And, and we, we had several demonstrations of this capability over the last year of Speech by Cloud in uh, uh, Tel Aviv in front of a live audience of 1,500 people and in Cambridge, UK, and so on. And, uh, but of course, beyond the demonstrations, the question is, what are the real use cases of this technology? And we think there are quite a, lot, quite a few interesting use cases. Think of a company that would like to collect feedback from uh, thousands of customers and clients about a service or about a product. Think, think about an employer that would like to collect feedback from thousands of employees or about a government that would like to listen to the voice of the citizens about new policies like social distancing and, and who knows. I believe that this technology establishes uh, a new and effective communication channel between the decision maker and the people that might be impacted by the decision. Uh, before uh, wrapping up, why pursue a grand challenge? So first of all, it helps us to advance science and to push and to push the boundaries of AI. It helps to pioneer research on new problems as we experienced uh, over the years. And of course, there are many use cases uh, that uh, I mentioned just a few of them. There are many more. And in fact, we are already in the process of integrating the better technology into Watson. Uh, many of the capabilities are available through the cloud. Some of them are already available through, through Watson today. And we have this uh, debater early access program where the plan is really to allow selected customers of IBM to explore together with us the potential of this technology for their use cases and for their data. Uh, I would like to wrap up by going back to, to grand challenges in artificial intelligence as I started. So, so really grand challenges in AI are there from day one, already in the 50s, uh, Arthur Samuel from IBM, the person who actually coined the, the term uh, machine learning. He was developing uh, a system capable of playing checkers. Uh, he spent decades on that. Today, it sounds kind of obvious, but Back then, it was a real sensation. Uh, later on, Jerry Tesaro, still in IBM research uh, today, uh, developed over the late 80s and early 90s uh, uh, the best software that can play by Gimon, actually using technologies that conceptually uh, are quite similar to what we saw more recently with DeepMind in, in AlphaGo. Uh, of course, in a completely different scale, but of course, the, but still the conceptual paradigms were already defined and pursued uh, back then. 
in the 90s, we had chess, and more recently, we had uh, DeepMind with AlphaGo and AlphaZero, as I already mentioned. But uh, uh, while these AI gun challenges were quite instrumental uh, in uh, advancing AI, I would like to argue that they lie in the what we what I refer to as the comfort zone of artificial intelligence. And uh, let me explain why. Uh, there are several fundamental reasons for that, but I will mention just one of them. When a board game is done, we know who won the game. And this has important implications because this means that we can actually let millions of versions of the software play against one another. And since after each game is done, we know who won the game, the system ca can improve by that. When a debate is done, we do not necessarily know who won the debate. It is not necessarily even obvious how to measure that. So we do not have this pass. So we need to define other ways to, to find other ways to make progress. And therefore, debater is, is most definitely out of the comfort zone of artificial intelligence. This is it lies in a new territory where humans actually still better, humans still prevail. Uh, but this is good because this means that we have we still have many open questions uh, to explore. And this is why it is so exciting. So let me uh, end by just thanking the remarkable debater team from IBM Research and, and pause here and take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Noam. Um, before we start with the questions, may I ask you to go full screen again? Ah, OK. Good point. Just a second. Yes, hello. <laughs> Great. So um, I have a question from our community. JP Corey is asking, what work is being done to address ethical governance of this technology? So, th so this is a good question. And uh, I think it is uh, valid uh, actually for any AI technology that, uh, that we are developing. And it is true also for the better technology. And uh, IBM in general is very active in, in uh, uh, considering this issue of ethical considerations when we develop AI. And this is true also for this research. We understand that we need to develop technologies that we can trust and, and moreover that we understand what they're doing. And, uh, and without going into too much details, I can say that at the least we are very transparent about what we were doing and over the years we shared with the scientific community exactly how we developed the technology and we published more than around 45 papers to date actually in all the top uh, uh, natural language understanding conferences. Uh, so we are very open about what we are doing and trying to be very careful about the technologies that we develop and do that responsibly. Really cool. Um, I have a personal question. Did you ever use the debater for arguing with your family, or like, did you try it with them, or just? Uh... So, <laughs> so it's a it's a cool question, and uh, it's 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 kind of the things that they tell you don't try that at home because it will upset everybody, right? But but uh, <laughs> but. but what we were doing actually is really as part of training the system we had a lot of sessions where we asked we had expert debaters as part of the team and they were competing with the system and we were learning from that but at some point you know when the expert debater is not not available or when we needed to do something quick we asked members from the team from the scientists to actually debate the system and this was quite amusing to see the team was very enthusiastic to see me debate project debater, but I refused. It felt too awkward. So anyhow, <laughs> that's the way it is. I guess it was it was a lot of fun. So um, yes. and Noam, can a project debater teach us humans to debate better? So uh, I think it's on a path to to do that. It's not. I wouldn't say, you know, today, if you are a, a, an expert debater, in principle, you can debate the system. So this is true. But but I think that there is a deeper level for this question of asking, can we learn using this technology to better formulate arguments, to better analyze controversial topics in an unbiased manner? And, and I think the 
answer is yes. A lot of these technologies can help us in this direction. Oh, that's wonderful. Great. Um, do we have another question? I guess, yes, I see one. Um, I check with, uh, with the screen. Uh, Tristan Reckhaus is asking, can you give some more examples on potential commercial use cases? Sure. Uh, so thank you, Tristan, for, for the question. And uh, uh, so, so I think that the, 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 really the interesting notion is that this is touching on a very fundamental issue that we experience in our life. The, the fact that most of the questions that we encounter through life do not have a simple factual answer. Rather, they have these pros and cons that we need to find. So one example beyond those that are already mentioned, imagine that you are asking yourself about you know, the pros and cons of social distancing. If we take a contemporary example, or you are interested in a different topic, whether AI will bring more harm than good. What technology do you have today to research this question? You can type in AI or social distancing in a search engine, and you will get a bunch of documents, and now you need to read them in order to process them. And this is a tedious uh, procedure. Imagine that instead you have this technology that already gives you the pros and cons and, and allows you to much more quickly understand the, the issue under consideration. Okay, thank you so, so much, Noam. I'm not sure if I uh, pronounce it right, but Lehitraut? Later. 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 Bye, bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. <laughs> bye, -bye. Okay. Thank you, Yezem, for the nice um, talk. Um, maintenant, j'ai l'honneur de vous présenter notre patron, our vice president, uh, digital strategy and IX, Sarah Benoui. Uh, let's have a look. <laughs> Welcome, Sarah. I hope my introduction was right. <laughs> so, uh, first of all... Hi, hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, Sarah, we are all experiencing tough times, actually. Um, can you give us um, any ideas how to shape um, um, a responsible enterprise during these times? Yeah, thanks. So, hello, everyone. Um, hope you're well, you're safe. Uh, Sarah Bernoui, I have the, the honor and the humility to lead a fantastic uh, a digital strategy and IX team in IBM services across Europe. And um, as Dominic has alluded, we are going through an extremely rough ride. Uh, so I'll have the pleasure to kind of um, highlight what is going on, what are the enterprises doing and what will be uh, the way to, uh, uh, to address it. Uh, don't hesitate to ask questions at the end, and if you would like, I'm going to share our deck uh, on this, yes. uh, and uh, hopefully everyone can see it. There we go. So, um, you are seeing it across Europe, across the world, uh, the extreme time we are going under. And the extreme digitization this has led, even the high level of organization that we're used to meet physically, CXOs, head of states, and this has shifted uh, extremely dramatically the new ways of working. Uh, where from uh, like it's never the same day than the day before. Uh, and uh, it started in, in, in China, obviously, but uh, I have to say, we are learning so much from them and all kudos to uh, the uh, Asian community who've uh, done massively and prepare ourselves massively when we are coming to much more fragmented countries in Europe. And, and it's tough because we see uh, European Union uh, trying to, to struggle to come up with a joint plan. And I'm not even talking about um, the rest of the world. So um, what does it shows to us is, is really uh, it, it creates a lot of trauma, a big supply shock. Uh, but at the same time, we see uh, areas of hope. We see that the new heroes today are uh, the medical professionals, uh, the firemen, 
uh, the, the nurses, the people, the cashier. So it's also putting back humanity uh, with, with jobs uh, that really also matter. We also see in those um, mental health difficult time where people are isolated, you have to take care of the elderly, uh, maybe the neighbor, that we are human, we are uplifting the spirit of each other. We sing at balconies all across the world. So uh, we have to also anchor ourselves in this positive attitude that there will be a new normal, there will be a, a, a tomorrow. So enterprises are quite fundamental, and I'm, I'm, I mean, you know it all, uh, to the fabric of our society. Uh, they provide jobs, they provide, um, you know, economic value uh, to the country or to, to uh, obviously global uh, uh, spread as well, different countries. And, and obviously they also pay bills to, uh, uh, you know, suppliers and have an impact on clients. So societies and enterprises are really within it. And um, what we are uh, experiencing is the acid test with a big A of the enterprise core value. How are you leaving them up towards your clients, towards your employees, towards society and the shareholders? People, organization uh, will remember how they were treated during those times. Because this is one in a lifetime, hopefully, hopefully, uh, event. So what we would recommend and what we're seeing is uh, enterprise have to do it authentically and uh, it's transparent. Uh, now we, we see with social media and the high digitization, everybody knows and we have to obviously avoid fake news, but you have to be authentic about the situation. Do it with empathy, do it digitally, and do it at scale, because this is touching everyone. Um, you know the key challenges. Uh, the human needs have, have completely be uh, changed, where this crisis in Europe and in, 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 in the world now are uh, changing the people working from home, uh, putting a strain, taking care of the neighbor, taking care of, of, of the children, homeschooling, or, or making sure the elderly are safe and well taken care of. Uh, and at the same time, anxiety about the future of, uh, of the workers. Uh, on the demand side, uh, well, the demand has, has completely plummeted. And, and, and that's what we see with a lot of government uh, pumping huge amount of, of, of money into the system in order to swallow the shock. And, and, and I have to say it's, it's a great coordination because in the little, little amount of time, remember 2007, it took a lot of time for the government to, to swallow the shock. Here we're seeing this in much, much more reduced time where countries' activities are reduced by 30% in some countries in Europe. Uh, supply chain threat. Well, most of our supply chain are totally global. Uh, from, uh, you know, pasta coming from uh, wheat, coming from Canada, uh, providing to the UK market and being manufactured in Italy to uh, the strains on toilet papers all across Europe at the moment. Uh, everybody and our enterprises, uh, uh, clients, and are seeing the massive shock on the supply chain. And then fiscal duress. It's going to be hard time, and we know it, not only in Q2, but going forward 2020, potentially year zero, because uh, governance is going to help. Uh, we will need empathy amongst companies and shareholders to really, really go through that wave in order for companies to, to strike. There are still winners uh, in these specific uh, instances, but it's going to be a rough ride. What would we recommend? We have to go back to not only working what the brain will dictate in terms of action plan, and I will uh, allude to that later on, but what drives the human or the homo sapiens, uh, as we know very well, is the heart. And, and we have to engage with humanity. That what elevates us, that what moves us forward. And that's where both dealing with your customer is providing very quickly the emotional impact that you have designed for the client, that very quickly it's intuitive and they can get up to it. For the employees, how are you going to influence behavior? You give them the mobile um, tooling, how are you going to potentially reskill them? Uh, it's an opportunity, it's a threat, but with the workforce that you're having, 
what can you do in those, I would say, lockdown time? For enterprises as well, how do you re-reverberate uh, your core values again? I'm really proud in IBM. Uh, they've weathered many, many, um, I would say, shocks uh, across the century, like many other of our clients. But you cannot undermine the need of, uh, or underestimate, sorry, uh, the need of storytelling. Uh, uh, what will convey to your um, to your clients, to your people, to your shareholders, why you are still relevant today as an enterprise with its core value and tomorrow when the new normal is kicking off. And then um, engage uh, with humanity on the ecosystem. Uh, you're not alone, alone uh, and I'm not going to sing the song. Uh, you're, there is a complete ecosystem of, of people where you can get up to, uh, up to scale from day two. So we will need to have this radical collaboration as we, in the IT service industry, a lot of software providers, you know, providing in ourselves as well, tooling for free for people to leverage. We see WebEx doing the same, et cetera. So there is no point of sometime, uh, you know, mobilizing huge amount of effort. It's about how do you radically collaborate? So, um, I'm sure uh, you heard from my, my uh, great colleague about the supercomputer and, and, uh, and Jimmy was fantastic on this. What I, I want to say is very quickly, and we see that in, in with other um, um, companies in our sectors, in three days, we launched um, Agnieszka in the Czech Republic in collaboration with the Ministry of Health in order to serve uh, you know, 1,500 citizens in the first few hours was done the same in, uh, in Spain, I see the same in Poland, it's going all over the, the, the world. This is not about business here, it's how you help health ministry to provide that flows of queries and, and anxiety, um, but really responding 70% uh, uh, or even more to the inquiry with the right chatbot and using our technology about uh, having the right tone, having the right empathy, and obviously, uh, I would say, light. Uh, it's it's a bit of a, uh, lightening the workload of those people who are at the front line. Um, IBM has launched also the weather company in order to provide uh, to a health agency uh, to track COVID-19, um, obviously, uh, view. And we're seeing from uh, LVMH, uh, or many uh, manufacturers across across Europe, uh, a complete re review of the production line in order to help the, the the society, in order to help the health profession. And I think banks will have a key role to play as well, and they're doing it. So it's all about as a as um as an enterprise, how you rethinking your role in society and what can you do to help. Um, in terms of influencing behaviors. What we're seeing is employees, uh, what is it? It's moving from uh, one workflow to another. So how we've helped also moving towards requisition tracking management systems. So I will, there are many examples. I go back to the storytelling, how you are going to move as an enterprise from digitization, which were pockets, to agilization of your workforce. And uh, it's been done with small enterprises, big enterprises, and how can you do that tomorrow remotely? And you have a lot of partners around who could do that for you in order to, um, I would say, take advantage, if I can say that, in those difficult times to work remotely. Um, in terms of radical collaboration, um, I'm sure Jeremy talked about uh, uh, blockchain, but where we see the pressure on retail, we are also going to see a lot of pressure on transparency, reliability, uh, traceability. And we've been there with many of the retail partners already in order to provide that transparency. So again, let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's leverage and use the technologies out there to provide what society wants and health system wants. Um, so that are the big themes, but there are things uh, enterprise are doing, and, and some have been doing it since the beginning of January uh, from our, our, our Asian uh, colleagues, what can enterprise do now? So number one is really a massive task force. I would say people call it war room. I like a language of peace. I would say peacekeeper room uh, to really align the organization 
and make sure that there is a consistency and clarity on the communication to the shareholders, to the clients, to the, to the employees. I'm sure many enterprises have done it, uh, but it's, it's fundamental to have uh, those specific task force. Um, in parallel, prioritize stakeholder safety and health. Um, you know, enterprise would be nothing without their, uh, uh, their workforce. And, and therefore, the mental health uh, of employees, customers, and partners in order to kind of weather that storm. And, 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 and you know, we in it together. So it's a massive storm and, and we're in it together. Number three, and I'm really proud for IBM for this, is ensure business continuity. Many enterprises had business continuity plan. Even countries got it. Uh, Switzerland had about six months uh, stuck management. So it, you do see they are building those business continuity plan, but it's a stress test of those business continuity plan. So uh, ask for support in your ecosystem. It's radical collaboration. Ask for support. And then let's not shy away. Enterprise needs to review their business planning. So reprioritize re 2020, uh, you know, fundamentals, uh, talk to the shareholders, and, and then what's going to be the dynamic response? So that's now, if not already uh, happening. Near term and, and finance and accounting, uh, finance and accounting are going to rule. Uh, not that it's bad, is enterprise needs to, uh, to be able to develop a certain cash flow in order to kind of obviously pay their workers, uh, in order to obviously uh, um, pay their suppliers and, and, and make sure that, um, you know, if they have a shareholders, if uh, there is something out there. So working with finance and accounting and the banks and in order to provide that lifeline in this, ensuring the surety, uh, the surety of supply and partners we are seeing that uh, the ecosystem that was able to uh, stand alongside uh, enterprises and clients will be the reliable partner. And, and the view of relying on partners that was extremely distributed, uh, maybe very, very cost effective, might not be the right partner in the new normal. Then what do you do with your talent productivity? You can enable them digitally. Long term, well, with those re-enabled talent and uh, hoping that it will be a V-shaped return or potentially an L-shaped return, how are you going to bring that back into the workforce? How are you going to make sure that maybe on what they've been skilled, it will be effective? And potentially, we're seeing a lot of our CXOs thinking of physical places. Do we need that many buildings? The CO2 footprint is actually quite high, and we are actually remotely enabling our people. Um, last two things is how do you engage customers, uh, give them some slack. Um, it's going to be quite hard for them. And, uh, and therefore, uh, how do you make sure that you're there for them, uh, but with full empathy of what they're going through. And there will be also opp opportunity. You look at the stock market right now to explore M and A. So it's been the case, it's a, it's a story of, of, of the markets, and therefore there are also opportunities. So that's it for me. Um, are you ready? I think nobody's fully ready. Uh, that would be quite arrogant, uh, but we are having the right momentum to do it. And, um, and as you, we are putting, uh, I would say, the right things in place. So let's talk. Uh, we are at your service uh, with the fantastic team of strategists, designers, and technologists we have uh, in IBM services and, and the overall IBM services, uh, obviously, uh, 180,000 across the world, in order to help you future proof or even now, uh, now proof your business, mobilize your workforce, and, and really make impact to society. So, ready for question? Um, Thank you for the opportunity. I'm just going to stop oops, stop sharing my screen. Exactly. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was very interesting. Very nice overview. Um, we have uh, um, a question from uh, from the community. It's uh, unfortunately it's a bit longer, so I have to read it from the screen. Uh, it says the humanistic aspects of purpose-led leadership have been seen as fluffy by many traditional businesses. Does this COVID-19 event burst through this fundamentally? I think it does. Um, 
And that's also why one of the uh, reasons why IBM is still thriving in a way, because when you are living up to your values, they're eternal. They are human values. And, um, and, and I could say IBM, but they are fantastic, uh, obviously, enterprises, big and small. And, and it's about how you live this value. And, and um, when there is such a tendency for uh, division, uh, everybody's going on to themselves, um, it, it has to force the leaders. It's in the time of storm that you see true leadership. Thank you very much. Um, a personal question from my side. What keeps you motivated these days? Oh, uh, the, this humanity. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, we have to, we have a duty uh, as human beings uh, to uh, concentrate on the positive. When I see uh, everybody clapping uh, to the medical professional, when I see the singing all across the street uh, in Europe, uh, when I see our, uh, our 17,000 um, uh, DSNIX, I would say, digital strategy NIX people, and in Europe, uh, are, are still going and, and servicing the people is what makes us uh, motivated. Uh, it's going to be tough, but it's only our attitude that, uh, and resilience that will make us, you know, weather that storm. Mm -hmm. Sarah, thank you very much for joining us. Have a nice rest of the day. À la prochaine. Uh, we will <laughs> see you. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Merci. Okay. So our next guest is already waiting in the line. He is a former colleague of mine, or of uh, the both of us. <laughs> and I'm really happy to announce David Blinderman. Hi, David. Hi, good to see you. See you guys. <laughs> How are you? All good? Great, great. That's nice. So, um, you will talk today about games people play solving serious challenges with game theory. You're, the stage is yours. Just okay. <laughs> okay, great. First of all, thanks for the invitation, everyone. I really appreciate being able to, to talk about this today, um, especially during the time we're living in right now. Hopefully, some positive and uh, thoughtful ways of moving forward and now how we can change the way we think and creatively solve problems. Um, my presentation started, I'm going to share my screen with you right now, as a collaboration with Dr. Andreas Stiegler who did his doctor in game development and AI. And this was a, a topic that really concerned us uh, when we realized how many people we were working together with in digital media or interactive media, and how few, few people were uh, up to date with, with common games or gameplay. There's a lot of the things that we grew up out of when we were young. And so we, through our conversations, we, we've uh, put together a presentation uh, that talks about our inspiration, where it comes from, and why we think it's valuable for, for us today and right, right now. Um, most of us, when we think about games, uh, the first thing that comes to mind are these ego shooters. That is a specific genre of game and a very, very specific one. This is one that when we ask most people, our colleagues and friends, do you play games? They say, no, no, it's not for me. That's not, not my kind of thing. Um, we tried to, or they think of it more in this kind of Mario Kart uh, type game. What we're talking about today, or what I want to talk about today, is a much broader idea of how games can be inspiration for us and how they can help us in our creative strategy, as well as how we organize ourselves creatively. And also how they give us inspiration to solve problems that we may not know we have or to find things that we didn't know we wanted. Um, so some people, I think, some people don't like games. We can think about lots of different kinds, and that's something I want to try and touch on a little bit with what do we think games are and how we define them. But I would say most people do like some kinds of games. And how can we use these as a way to encourage people to participate with us or also to learn something? How, how can games be utilized in different ways to, to increase our, or improve our experience? Um, I grew up with a mom who was very creative and 
always designing board games for myself. So I grew up with this constant, um, basically a guinea pig of being the tester of my mom's games. Later, uh, when I got my first computer, Commodore 64, that was my first experience learning the technology, it was learning how to program basic games on my Commodore 64. These were very simple games, kind of Lunar Lander style games. But what they taught me is it also uh, was my first, my first experience with digital media and my first experience with interface and interaction with my computer, also the personality behind it. And for me, when we think in the broader terms of games, I think it's very important to understand that games are a, a unique interface for us socially. Um, now my girlfriend and I, for example, are, have broken out the board games at home and it's a different way of interacting, especially for socially awkward people. Games can be a new interface, a certain set of structured rules. So it's a different way to interact with each other. And I want to come back later to this when we talk about how we work together uh, in an organization, because I think there's some key elements of this that we can apply to our work to make it more fun and also to give us better ideas. Um, the topic of teamwork, how, how do games exist? How do they bring people together or the competition side of it? Storytelling, different ways. When we look at the indie game scene, for example, many different ways of telling stories. How do we write? How do we interact with the story? How do we experience it uh, or the personality? And the design of more complex interactions or tools inside of that. These are all things, uh, one of my favorite games recently, Super Hot. Um, a really big idea, a different perception of what our reality is, or just having simple fun. The Untitled Goose Game is a, a really clever, no strategy except for just annoying people. You play the goose and you basically run around and annoy people. So just different ways of explaining how games are not always um, what we first expect. They also don't have to be digital but they can give us also a different way of perceiving our reality, maybe looking at it from a different perspective through humor, also kind of jumping sideways in our brain. I think those are all things that I have gotten personally from, and also my colleague, uh, Andreas, is something that talking about the things that we loved growing up and seeing how we can apply what we learned from those games into our professional life is, is something that we want to share with, with other people and to try and see games differently. And what I, what I wanted to do today is I just showed you a lot of what people would say are conventional games or digital games. What I wanted to do today is show something, how we see this in our everyday lives that are maybe what we wouldn't conventionally call games, but are based on that same kind of behavior or gameplay. Um, one of the early creators, first creators, Louis von Ahn in 2000, who created the CAPTCHAs that we all know by now and of course find extremely annoying, um, that was originally designed as a kind of a twofer to teach machines how to identify images and pictures and also a somewhat game-like interface for users to interact to uh, prove their identity that they weren't, for example, a robot. His last project was Duolingo, which is one of the most popular language learning sites. So we applied the same some of the same basic structure in the first versions of Duolingo for learning languages, he applies in creatively uh, for, from CAPTCHAs, he's then applied creatively for how people can learn languages in a more fun and interactive way and to also gamify the whole process. So it becomes less of a chore and more of a fun or more of a, more of a game out of that. Um, this next one, um, it's an example for music using games with music. I think what's really important about this one, or what I find most interesting about it, is how we can encourage people to participate in something that they might not normally want to do by using a game like Interface. And for this one, I need us to play a video. It's a short one, one minute long, uh, with Bobby McFerrin at the at TED Talk uh, from 2009, I believe. We can play that video now. And Yeshem, if you can tell me when it's done. Expectations. Expectations. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Bye. 
Okay. And for me, it's a lovely example of how we can use game-like behavior to get people to participate in something, also to break down some barriers that they might have with awkwardness. Um, it also can be, as particularly for my own creative strategy, um, uh, but also those of others of artists. It's a, a cl some classic strategies for how we can think about something. One of my favorite projects um, that I often like to talk about um, is from Adam Harvey, the CV Dazzle. This experience of defeating, first of all, learning how facial recognition works and then finding ways to sabotage it or defeat it becomes a, a, an output of also a fashion, some, a look, something very post rave in my opinion, very interesting to look at. But uh, drawing on that experience, using facial recognition later to identify arsenal shot in, in, in Syria, for example, and finding where that arsenal came from. So taking creative strategies that can be applied for sabotaging or kind of playful breaking of things, but then also turning it around and using it for good or for helping activists in Syria. Um, another colleague or contemporary of Adams is James Bridal. He uses a very similar strategy for, uh, for example, uh, sabotaging autonomous cars, creating a pattern that essentially locks an autonomous car inside of a circle. Um, and so we, we can see how the way we think, how, how we think and how we play or attack problems or attack something that we're interested in using a game-like strategy can bring us to very unusual solutions or, or potential uh, challenges that we didn't know were there. Um, another uh, uh, favorite project of mine is from uh, friends in New York from Wearable Media Studio that took fashion design and they're constantly trying to find the interface between fashion and technology and wearable media. And in this instance, also using Instagram filters or camera filters that react with the fashion labels camera. So it, it provides kind of a digital fragrance around the fashion, the kind of a very playful approach to how we think about clothes, how we think about also the interaction between photography and friends or finance, a uh, classic uh, example, Venmo, essentially re uh, revolutionized how we pay each other in the States years ago by simply opening up a socialization component to this, where the messages back and forth made simple payments more fun and also encouraged people to use their product and enjoy the product. It gave the brand a personality. Um, and this can be applied, this is being applied right now in everyday uh, situations for chronic pain management. For example, a recent project from the Netherlands that uh, through VR uh, puts uh, chronic pain uh, patients inside of an immersive environment so that they forget about the pain that they have and that they actually learn, they learn about how that pain is, uh, how that's affecting their brain and how to counteract that. So it gives them some immediate relief, plus over time, it reduces uh, the, 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 or helps them with the management of their pain. Uh, UK cancer research is another very practical example of how uh, game designers are being invited to work with scientists in solving problems that of data visualization or collaborative schemes for how can we help scientists identify certain things just like the CAPTCHA that need to have human eyes on a problem. How can we create games that help identify patterns, for example, that can uh, help with cancer research and finding uh, finding a medication for that. Um, another, one last example that's very different. Also, when we think of games, quite often we think of characters, um, cute things, or these ego shooters. What I love about uh, how Field IO works um, is almost always some kind of playful element to their work. But this is not the kind of character or cartoony world. They essentially, for Nike Force of Nature, use your activity and break your image up into particles that are then kind of like paintbrush uh, animation based on the intensity of your workout. So it's a very abstract way of gamifying your activity and also in something that's much more abstract and maybe more adult or artistic in that respect um, instead of cute or playful. And uh, another favorite example, last one, uh, is IBM's own Think uh, 2019 community, also done by uh, Field IO, taking uh, brand engagement and a technology-based uh, engineering company 
and bringing a, a warmth and human element through playful uh, visualization. So a, a strategy that comes from a creative, more playful way of thinking, how can we take that and apply that to also what a brand feels like, how it, how it interacts with, with uh, future customers or clients? Um, the part that uh, Andreas participated in uh, most of all was in, inspiring me with some references. Uh, first of all, working together to try and define in our own studio how, how we would like to work in, the in our next steps, how we, some important things. Whoops, sorry. Uh, one of these things is to try and stay curious. We tried to introduce our designers and engineers, our project managers, we tried to introduce them to new games, different games, board games, as well as digital games, but to also encourage people to watch on YouTube, to learn about what's currently being played, how people, what kind of strategies are involved, to uh, also not try and think outside of the box, to explore different games, to find things that might be fun to interact with others with, to try it out, and to keep, keep introducing that art of play inside of our work process. So in design thinking, trying to think of design thinking also from a, a game perspective or how can we make it more playful and essentially ultimately having fun. Um, some, some of the work that I think is most inspiring is an article from Richard Bartle from 1996. This has been very much contested in the last 10, 15 years. Um, but it made some really interesting points about how we would organize ourselves creatively. Um, this comes from the perspective of MUDs or multi-user dungeons or massive multi-online role-playing games. Um, but I think when I read this and when I see this, it inspires me immediately to think about how we work together and the different personalities, not just the disciplines of programmers, developers, uh, management or uh, client partners or designers, different kinds of designers, but to also think in terms of personalities. How do we, how do we think about people and their personalities and how they contribute? And Bartle basically broke down the most essential, in his opinion, the most essential elements to how, what makes a successful game or a successful digital ecosystem. Um, and the different types of players from killers to achievers, socializers, and explorers, but not to think of as people as being one or the other, but that all of us have some different kind of mix in this, or depending on how we're thinking or what kind of problem we're solving or the ecosystem we're in, we might take on different roles. And this how players interact with each other and how they create an organization, and also how they interact with their world and as well as the other players. And I think it's something that's hugely inspiring, inspiring especially when we compare some of these older archetypes that we've used for decades now in branding to think of brands or ecosystems, digital ecosystems from the perspective of what have we learned from digital games or video games over the last 20 years and how might we apply that to defining ourselves, our organization and putting together teams that are more successful or have more fun doing their job and also work together in different roles rethink that role or to rethink how our brand feels and where where we focus on interaction with the brand. Um, my, one of my favorite quotes, I, I think this is just particularly relevant, that creativity is not a talent that is gifted to just certain people. I think it's something that can be shared across any discipline and it's a way of thinking rather than a specific gifted talent. And closing, I think we'll always have games. We can try and bring them more into our life. We can also try to explore how we work together and play together um, to uh, have, have more enjoyment in our everyday life and also interact with other people in new ways. And I'm gonna jump out of keynote here. much David yeah great um, it's really great to see your passion for games <laughs> so um, I have a question as some of us haven't played in a while I guess uh, what's your advice to um, get started again uh, David I we can't hear you you are muted <laughs> okay there we yes. go 
Um, I, I think it's most important to, to talk with friends. Uh, I always have had some friends who are gamers in the pure sense of the word. I am not. I, I actually prefer reading books more than anything else <laughs> in my free time. But I, I hear, I, I get demos of, of games. I get recommendations from friends. I also actively look, uh, for example, Kotaku is a very good newsletter that features different, very different types of games. And right now, YouTube, it's very easy to just uh, simply watch people play games. And I, I find that highly enjoyable to watch someone playing a game. It's a very quick yeah. way to get in and understand, okay, this is the world, this is the strategy, just this is maybe for me or not for me. So it's something that you don't just randomly go out and buy games, but to actually watch other people play. Great. Um, I so it's... I have a comment from Klaus Rügenmann. He says, I feel this focus on playfulness and joy aspects from games are very important. And uh, welcome in the current situation with COVID, uh, which is um, felt to be depressing by many. So great inspiration. And thank you, David, he said. Thank you. Um, so, which game is your favorite one? Um, right now, I, I, I got an Oculus Quest in November, and my favorite game, uh, I would say there's many different reasons why I would name one, but Super Hot. Super Hot is something everyone should play. I brought it home with me over Christmas, and everyone from little kids to adults, grown adults, absolutely loved it. And what it does is it plays with the physics of time. Only when you move, does the game proceed? So every time you move, the game moves quicker. So it's a very brilliant idea for how to, uh, an alternate, alternate reality that's incredibly intuitive. You don't need any instructions. You learn it by doing it. And I would highly recommend that, or also watching it on, on YouTube to get a feel for how it works. That's cool. Um, do, we have a, do we have time for another question? Yeah. Yes, great. Um, so when does a game work? When is it? When it is fun? When it's fun? Well, uh, I mean, I, I I like to break away from. That's why I tried to show some examples that we might not think are typically games in the sense of video games. I think a game works when when uh, when we're caught off guard. I think humor is essential for part of that. How when, as soon as we start to laugh or as soon as we start to immerse ourselves in a media, we very quickly, we, we start to see the effects of game-like elements. Um, David, thank you so, so much for your inspirational talk. I liked it very much, really. And it was really great to see you again. <laughs> yeah, and nice um, I need to uh, have a look into the camera. Thank you, guys. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, see you soon again. Thank and you. Uh, have a good day. Bye bye. Thank, thank you, you guys. Well from my side, David. See you soon. So hopefully um, my next guest is a bit used to Germans having problems with pr the pronunciation of her name. I will try. Uh, we will now see Laia Avellan Ponce de Leon. Um, let's have a look first. Hey, Laia. Um, thanks for joining us today. As we just uh, saw on screen, um, you're working for Facebook as um, creative strategist and Facebook gave us this opportunity to use the platform for today's digital conference. So now the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Dominic. Thank you everyone for tuning in and thank you to the extended team behind you for this amazing job. Um, as you heard, my name is Laia and Dominic pronounced my surname properly, I'm a miss. And I work at Creative Shop. So I, let me start with what is Creative Shop so that we frame the conversation. Creative Shop, and I will use one metaphor by a colleague of mine. Creative Shop is like, think of it, a bionic arm that you can pluck to your brand or to your business, to your agency in order to help you run more innovative and communications on our platform, communication that helps you connect with communities, with the world. Something that nowadays we're seeing is more important than ever. I myself am Spanish, as you notice by the name. I live in Berlin and I stay connected through these challenging times with my family over Instagram, Facebook, you name it. Well, now over to the talk, um, over, over to 
creative responsible or responsible creative in the digital era. We've heard today many experts talking about what it is, what it means to do responsible marketing. I'm not going to talk about what it means. Um, we have a, we have had better, greater experts talking about it. But I'm going to try to show you, walk you through some opportunities that I see how creative work on our platforms could help you as a brand, as a business to actually leverage these investments, leverage these efforts into being more responsible and being more uh, sustainable and communicate across and make sure that consumers actually understand it. Because I would argue, and that's the start of my presentation, that Responsibility is not just doing the right thing as a business or brand, but actually helping consumers do also the right thing. And I'm going to start sharing my presentation. Just hold on with me one sec. This will bring us to the first opportunity area. Okay, there we go. It should be showing now. Perfect. So where do we start? I would say always start as humans do, start a conversation. And luckily you can have a conversation on our platforms as well at scale with many people. That's what we call conversational marketing in a more common language. We also refer to it as chatbots. Now, why are chatbots interesting for you? All the efforts that you put into doing the right thing, into um, behaving more responsibly as a business are quite complex sometimes for consumer to understand. And chatbots allow you to actually take big pieces of information and break them down to the most elementary bits that are relevant for consumers. Let me show you some examples based on my work with FMCG and the immobility industry that are more um, my natural um, pieces of work. So let's say you are a food retailer and people out there are trying to buy more regionally. Uh, so how could you help them? You could actually set up a chatbot that actually help them understand and navigate which products are seasonal. Because let's be honest, avocados are not always in season. So with that, you could start a very natural, very um, consumer relevant conversation in order to educate them into what's helpful, what's more sustainable. And through this relevant angle, then you could obviously um, provide them recipes and provide them the opportunity to actually buy online these products. From another angle, you could also tap the big question on what are the carbon footprint implications of my choices as a consumer? What if I decide to go vegan? What if I decide to go paleo? These are very complex um, decisions and they have complex implications. So as a brand, as a food retailer, you could actually help consumers and actually break it down for them and make it more easy to understand and then decide whether which choice they want to take. Now over to the other uh, vertical industry that I work with, the automotive industry, and over to the immobility world. I want to highlight one use case of um, chatbots. Chatbots are safe spaces, safe spaces for conversations and safe spaces for the brands. The brand can address critical challenging topics and for the consumers, because the consumers can actually ask any question in a chatbot without fear of being laughed at. So what if a car brand were to address the elephant in the room and actually create a bot that helps consumer figure out what the most socially responsible or environmentally responsible choice of mobility could be for them according to their mobility needs. Because this might be different if you're driving every day than if you're just driving once every two months. Now over to a next area of opportunity. Starting a conversation is a great way to actually open up as a brand and be more transparent. But you can also go the next level as we're doing right now and have the next level of transparency and actually just go and use the lives. Lives on Facebook, live on Instagram allows us to create and enhance transparency and connection with consumers. It's almost this like hide nothing test. So how to use lives as a business? I'm sure nowadays, these days, from working from home, we all have taken part in many several lives. A lot of them are informative um, or descriptive. 
you could do this as a business as well. For instance, picture this, you could have one ad on our platforms that shows your um, product. In this case, in a very cliche, stocky looking uh, picture on the left, you would have a dairy producer. And once as a consumer, you see this ad, you could actually just click through it and be connected to a live camera in, in the production, in the production uh, site of, um, the, um, of, of this um, producer, thus enabling one click interaction with your business. Over to a next application of the live. You can be very descriptive, but you can also um, integrate the life into a higher overarching storytelling initiative. So now back to the immobility world. If you're launching an electric car, what about instead of just asking people to go and test drive it, which of course has also environmental implications because they take their non-electric car to there, you could create the first group test drive where thousands of millions of people actually chip into uh, a life and actually drive with you through this test drive. Just picture this in a very entertaining, engaging way in the ways that we see in the US have um, done some karaoke and then have the community equally to our live stream actually asking any questions and getting lots of information out of there. Lives are a beautiful opportunity for you to compress lots of information that sometimes can be quite complex to communicate and quite dry into a very engaging and entertaining way. Now, over to a third area of opportunity. Um, some of you might have been playing these days uh, where we are at home uh, with AR filters. A lot of the AR filters, augmented reality filters that we use, um, are based on a technology that recognizes our face. Um, this can be very funny. I reckon these days I've used them more than ever. Um, but this can be also used differently. So I want to raise awareness towards another use of uh, augmented reality that actually uh, helps you create really augmented realities around a product or a phone. Let's, let me show you one picture um, so that you understand. Imagine you are an FMCG producer and you are putting a lot of effort into um, developing products that are more sustainable. Now, these are reasons for consumers to switch from one product to another, but sometimes they can be very dry actually to, to communicate. But what if you could use augmented reality, you could use AR and you could use this little friend over here that everyone has with themselves when they go to a supermarket and actually have people use it in order to unlock a um, world of information around this product. So your product works equally than our face as a trigger in order to unlock information. This could make the discovery and consideration of your product way more engaging and fun. Now on to the fourth area of opportunity. Um, we've seen um, some other ways of transforming very raw, heavy, complex data into engaging data. Now, one of the issues that I see with a lot of the efforts towards sustainability and responsible marketing is that it's quite heavy stuff. And it's quite far off and detach it from consumer's reality, especially when we are talking, uh, for instance, about the automotive uh, industry and they're talking about the reach of an electric car or uh, the cost of an electric car. People are terrible at estimating. Just think about yourself. I'm certainly terrible estimating my weight. I'm terrible estimating the drinks I had the night before. Imagine if you have to understand higher, bigger, more complex data. That's where dynamic data and real-time data can actually provide you with an opportunity to break down um, this information and do the math for consumers so that it's relevant, not for the uh, general of the society, but for the individual people. So let me show you some two last examples. Imagine the cost of an electric car. This is the cost of 
ownership as opposed to the cost of purchase is a relevant um, point in the decision making. But most people who switch from a non-electric um, car to an electric don't have a reference point. So it's very difficult for them to understand the cost that they are likely to face. So what about actually correlating this cost with a more relatable cost unit, like the price of buying breakfast, in this case, eggs and bacon. Um, you could cross reference this in real time and create multiple sets of dynamic ads that are played different to each person depending on where they are. So in the UK, you could correlate the position with the cost of having an electric car with the cost of uh, eggs and bacon. In Germany, you could have some ads that cross-reference the cost of an electric with the cost of Franz Wurzchen in Hamburg or just Berliner in Berlin to be very cheesy and cliche. And now on to the last examples of how real-time dynamic um, data can help you make big data points that are complex to understand more relevant. Who knows what 500 kilometers, which is one of the standard new ranges for electric cars are. I certainly don't know and I love to drive. So you could create some ads that are cross-referencing the location where the user is and actually not just saying 500 kilometers, but through almost like, imagine this is an unscrollable ad. You go through the ad and actually it takes you from the location you are at to the most likely far off location that you could drive with your electric car on one go. Hence, translating a very abstract figure into something that is more relatable for your unique situation. And that's it for now. We've seen four opportunities on how virtual uh, digital communication can help you actually bring across and communicate your environmental and sustainability efforts, start a conversation with chatbots, go full circle and transparency with uh, lives, um, try to turn your products into an opportunity for communication through target AR and through augmented reality, or break down big complex data into relatable individual data through uh, real-time dynamic ads. With that, I think I even ahead of time, but then we can um, open up for Q and A's. May I ask you to go full screen before? Yes. Wonderful. Um, and before we start with our questions, uh, I want to remind all our viewers who just joined us online, um, you can ask um, whatever you want our speakers, just add it in the comment section and then we will um, um, bring, it, bring it back on screen after the speeches. So Laia, um, our first one, um, can you tell us some creative ways to connect in times of social distancing? distancing? Well, I think um, lives right now are one of the most important ways mm. and most relevant ways of connecting, not just on our platforms, of course, uh, I use uh, Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp, I would say, all my communication with my uh, family is via WhatsApp. You can have calls with multiple people, but we're seeing a lot of uh, different applications out there that people are using, um, very fun one with Zoom. So I think just creating this sense of closeness through life and life chats and life connections, it cannot uh, substitute the experience of being close to one another, but at least it can make this uh, social distancing a bit more bearable. Uh, one more question from my side. Um, what are your favorite hashtags at the moment? And of course, <laughs> hashtags are something very simple, but uh, I think people um, on social media, they are talking about what happened, what's going on out there using those hashtags. So is there something uh, you just saw in sure. the last days? Um, I think, I mean, being in Berlin, uh, one of the things that have, mo have moved me the most is to see how many people, many small businesses have reached out to social media in order to find ways to cope with the situation, which is very, very challenging for them. And I think one beautiful initiative that has um, risen out of this is um, United We Stream. So all the clubs in Berlin area are working together under this hashtag and streaming every day. I think this is beautiful and it's a beautiful way to actually come together also and help our local businesses. 
Uh, on the other hand, I also see big brands who are using hashtags in order to raise awareness towards the need to stay at home. So any, um, any efforts that we can all uh, do in order to uh, go through this in a united way and actually be careful and, and mindful of our responsibility to stay home are welcome and uh, need to be supported. Um, there's another question from one of our users. Again, it's a bit longer, so I have to, to read it. Um, uh, what's Facebook's own creative take on acting more responsibly when it comes to issues like sabotaging democratic elections, spreading of fake news, and um, something else I can read from here, and the toleration of hate speech asked by Peter Steigerwalder? Thank you for this question. I obviously, uh, for this, my calm. Um, just to be fully transparent, as Creative Shop, I, uh, for better or worse, I don't have any direct responsibility with our policies and our guidelines. I know um, they can be uh, mm. criticized and I have my own personal opinion about mm. it. Um, I, I cannot disclose any information about it. I can just say I'm really, as a person um, that works within the company, um, amazed and touched But all the other work that we're also doing in order to support the community. So I know we have a lot of flaws and they're spoken on that, but I can't, it's not on my area of expertise. I can't disclose yeah, uh, any more information. I understand. But uh, one last question um, is, um, what inspires you on a daily basis? I think human beings. I mean, I work in tech, but tech is just there in order to connect us all. So when I see that my parents, for instance, actually decided to sign into Instagram in order to follow our quarantine at distance, I'm not fascinated by Instagram, although I work with Instagram. I'm just fascinated about human beings being able to learn out of adversity and to find new ways to connect. Um, so I think in the end, it all goes back to humans and how we communicate and tech is just the enabled. Mm -hmm. Okay, Laia, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, it was a pleasure to have you here. And thank you so uh, much. wish you the best for the rest of the week. Stay bye safe, bye. everyone. Bye. Bye bye. Yeah, thanks, Lai, also from my side. <laughs> um, I have a, a dear colleague of mine waiting for us um, in our WebEx. So um, let's see Jan Pilar. <laughs> Yeah, I really haven't seen you in a while, right? <laughs> that is true. <laughs> so you're in home office? I am, I am, absolutely. Confined as everybody else. Great. So your topic today, uh, Jan, is trust in the data economy. And uh, let's hear what you've to tell us. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jan Pilar. I run business design here at the IBM Studio NX, currently in my home office. And I would like to elaborate a little bit on the role of trust in the data economy. And to make my points, I would like to bring up a, a presentation because I think that makes some things much clearer. Trust in the data economy. What are we talking about? Basically, um, what we're seeing when we look at data is a huge explosion in the amount of data. There is more and more data coming in. Enterprise data, social media data, transactional data, data from all the sensors and devices. It's an exponential curve and we are somewhere in the middle to the beginning of that curve. And that huge amount of data drives a new way of deriving value, something we call the data economy. What does that mean? If we look at it, some products, even well-known products, let's take a car, for example, are being superseded in the value of the car itself by the data that the car produces. Traditionally, car is a very big item. A car is, for example, the second biggest purchase most families make besides their home. And yet, now in the very near future, the data coming from cars will be much more valuable than the car itself because there will be data on the driving style of the 
a driver, there will be personal data on the driver, there will be data on the condition of the road the car is driving on, there will be data on the traffic condition the car is driving in, a ton of data coming from one individual car. And that data can be used to gain insights, to build new business models, to create new services using that data to create value, maybe even selling that data to third parties who might generate value from that data. That's what we call the data economy. And that leads us to a new way of value creation, because value creation in the data economy is the amount of data you have access to, the number of your data signals or data sources, times your ability to integrate the data, to mine it, to derive insights, to analyze it, to process it. That is where the value is. And that's why people talk about data being the new oil, data being or becoming one of the most important resources for organizations. It's because of this value creation that is possible with data and the ability to process that data. So what does that have to do with trust? How does trust come into the equation here? Well, the amount of data you have access to is a direct result of the trust you enjoy by your customers and partners. If they don't trust you, they will not give you their data. What we're seeing is that the Wild West days, if you collect whatever you get your hands on, you just collect the data, store it, process it, you're not even asking for permission, these days are over. We're seeing with GDPR, with CCPA, with other legislations and regulations, that trust and really earning that trust to get access to the data becomes super vital to be able to derive value. And that is why once a year, uh, we run a large study as IBM, global study, uh, we uh, survey C-level executives around the world, what is high on the agenda, what keeps them up at night. And in the last couple of years, obviously data, data leadership have always been very high on the list. It has always been about, we want to become data driven. We need to become an insights driven company. We need to become data leaders and so on. And that's all right. And this year it becomes very clear that there's the realization without trust and having trust as an organization, you will not become a data leader because without trust, you will not get access to the data. And you'd have the best data science team in the world. If they don't have a data pipeline that it's constantly filled with new and current data, that's no good. You need to keep data flowing in. You need trust to make that happen. Problem and challenge is obviously that currently there's a lot of trust issues around data. We're seeing data leaks and breaches everywhere. Every week, another company loses data. We have seen all these social media scandals, Cambridge Analytica mining data, mining profiles, using them for very questionable purposes. We have a general mistrust of, is there too much unwarranted data collection going on? Is everybody just siphoning off data into their systems and not even asking for permission what's really going on? We see a growing mistrust in the whole act of data brokerage and data selling. Even if you didn't give someone access to personal data, they can buy it somewhere else. Is that okay? And we see autocratic regimes in Russia, in China, using data for surveillance purposes. And we're asking ourselves, might the whole data economy maybe even undermine our democratic values and systems? So a lot of trust issues going on. And so we need trust, and there's a lot of not trustworthy situations out there. So what should you do in your organization for your organization? Well, let's look at trust, and let's try to understand trust a little bit. And trust is well understood in psychology, in behavioral sociology. Uh, trust has been studied for decades. And trust is actually a combination of the competence that is attributed to you as an organization, as a company? Are you able to do what you claim you can do? Are you able to deliver against your promises? And on the other hand, are you displaying ethical behavior? Are you an ethical company? Because you can do all these things, but if you're not you doing it in them in a fair way, in a win-win situation way, in fair use for everybody, that might not be good that you're only competent. So you have these two components of trust, and research shows that 25% is competence. Are you competent in doing stuff you claim you'll be doing? And 75% is ethics. Are you a fair company? Are you having a fair use, fair share, fair processing of data? That is how you earn trust. So as an organization, you have to look at these two components and really try to influence them in a way that helps you to build trust to then gain and earn value in the data economy.
problem is, if we look at the current trust situation around the world, and Edelman, a huge PR firm, is surveying trust around the world every year for, I think, more than two decades and showing fluctuations in trust and certain issues in trust. Currently, no institution is seen as both competent and ethical and therefore really trustworthy. If we look at governments, they're not seen as competent, especially when it comes to data, and they're seen in many places of the world as highly unethical. If you look at NGOs, for example, they're seen as ethical, but not as competent. And businesses are seen as competent or somewhat competent, but not as ethical. So it's a big dilemma. We need trust. Trust is competence and ethics and no player in the market, in society, in the institutional space is bringing these two components to the forefront in a way that really um, helps people to trust them and to really help um, establish that trust that is needed. So what you want to do is go up to that upper right corner. That's where you need to go. And the question is, how do you do that? Maybe shameless self-promotion here for our company. We are very proud that we are one of the most ethical companies and have been voted as one of the most ethical companies for years in a row. And make no mistake, this is not because we only do gooders and we are so socially conscious. Yes, we are. Of course we are. But we also do that because it makes perfect business sense. Because we know being an ethical company and being recognized as an ethical company and investing in people in places and processes that help us being an ethical company makes business sense because it helps us to gain the trust of partners, of customers, of suppliers we need to survive and thrive in the data economy. So what should you do to gain trust or maybe regain trust if you might have lost it or never build it up? First, you have to be transparent. And that might seem obvious, but you have to be truly transparent on what you do with data. What data you store, collect, how you collect and store them, how you process the data, what you actually do with the data, you have to make it very clear. And if we look how most companies, most data-driven companies are actually dealing with that topic, we see that there's not a lot of transparency going on. A lot of privacy policies are so inscrutable because it's actually huge word clouds of legalese, up to 150,000 words. That's a few hundred pages of finely written, densely written legal text, all the fine print. And that's not transparency. There's so many loopholes, there's so many things, you have no idea, I mean, whoever reads these things, and if you do, you're probably still not sure what's happening. So that's not the transparency we're looking for. You have to get better and do better than that. And this is especially important when you, we look at the next stage of data analytics and the usage of data when we look to the field of AI. Because here, it's not only about data collection and data processing and data storage. It's about really deeply going into the models you're deploying, the models you're using, the machine learning models you're putting into place, and showing or demonstrating that they can be trusted, that there's no built-in bias, that they are robust, that they're aligned in values to your values, to the values of the customers and partners, to the values of society. And you have to make that very clear. And we as IBM, we invest a lot in these topics and have a lot of open source knowledge here and produce a lot of knowledge via research and so on to really make AI and the AI we implement trustworthy. And you should do the same and really think about ethics. You should do it proactively and not only be driven by regulation and basically always being one step behind and just being forced to do so. That's not how you become a data leader and a business leader in the data economy. Secondly, you have to create real value in exchange for data. The days when, when customers basically said, well, I'm getting a more personalized experience, whatever that means. Does it just means, mean better targeted ads maybe? Does it just mean a little less ads or something? That's not enough. And research clearly shows that people are getting fed up of not knowing what actually they're getting in return for all their data. So what you need to do with your business models, with your digital services, is find ways to really provide true value in exchange for data. A good example is usage-based insurance. That's an example for, for car uh, insurance. Basically, people give up data on their driving style and their driving behavior when they get immediately rewarded. If you drive more safely, you pay less. Your car insurance premium goes down. If you buy, drive recklessly, 
it goes up, you pay more. There's an immediate link between the data you provide on your driving style and the value you get. We see a lot of promising models, service models, and business models built on that direct exchange, especially the healthcare space, especially around personal fitness, in insurance. And we hope to see more of that. And this is what we want to build with our clients, really services that have a real value in exchange for data, because then people are trusting and they're giving up that data willingly because they get something in return. Third, you need to provide control because some people may not see value in what you do with their data and they need the option to opt out. And this has been understood by all large data-driven companies that the future is private and you have to accept that too and you have to allow controls to opt out to really allow people to see what you're doing with the data, how you're processing the data, where you're storing the data, who you're sharing the data with. What we're seeing here is a lot of blockchain-based systems. We're expecting a lot more of that in the future, where it's not just opting out and you have some controls of basically, can that be collected, can that be shared, but you get a more granular view encrypted in the blockchain where you basically really deeply can see who accessed your data, who did what with your data, who shared your data, who sold your data, and you can basically detect each individual transaction and opt out of transactions and have full control over the data you provide. That's what we call control, and that is what you should think about when you want to become a data leader and a leader in the data economy. Last but not least, you have to have a governance framework in place that helps you to deal with data responsibly. On the management level, that means it's not enough to know that your guys are doing something with data somewhere in your organization. You cannot relegate that to the data scientists alone. It's a management task and a management responsibility to live up to that challenge of trust. And we're seeing that with a lot of companies. They're installing chief data officers, chief privacy officers, and really taking that serious that trust, privacy, governance around data is key. But you also have to do it on a technical level. You have to make good governance of data, privacy, key engineering principle in your company. Whatever you build, whatever you do, think privacy from the beginning. Think data security, cybersecurity, think encryption, how are you encrypting your data in the cloud? These are key questions you should ask at the beginning of any project, not only in the end, how are we gonna safeguard the data? That should be front and center in any project. So there you have it, trust in the data economy. Why is that important? Because in the data economy, value is a function of your number of data sources of signals, the amount of data you have access to, and the ability to integrate that data, derive insights from that data, process that data. And you will only have access to a large number of data signals, especially in this new legislative environment, if you enjoy trust by customers and partners, and they give you access to the data you need to derive value. And to get that trust, remember, trust is competence, 25%, and ethical behavior and ethics, 75%. By really focusing on four areas, transparency and explainability of what you do with the data and why you do it, creating real value and exchanging real value in return for data, providing controls, that is not just a simple opt-out, that's deeper controls, ideally blockchain-based controls, and have a governance framework in place that is responsible, that is on the management side, implemented in a way that really governs data responsibly and makes responsibility around data a key engineering principle. This is it for me, and I'm looking forward to some questions and some discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jan. Um, can you just uh, go back to full screen? Yes. For all of you out there, uh, we will um, have a, a recording of all the four hours we are doing today. So um, if you have, like, if you want to know more or just um, join our live stream, you have the chance to um, see it afterwards again. 
So, Jan, um, our first question or my first question is how can we make sure um, that our data is protected? Um, well, it's a complex question. Um, protection, I would say, in the, in the narrow sense, I would say that really comes down to, to security of data, that comes down to storage and encryption and, and really making cybersecurity a key aspect of any digital project you're running. Yeah. Not an afterthought, and really getting in security engineers and cybersecurity experts and data guys early and together in the same room, thinking about this um, and building this into, into anything you do. Um, a good guideline are basically what's happening in healthcare, what's happening in government services, because here obviously data protection and privacy is key to acceptance, to adoption. And I think a lot of companies can learn from what's happening in these two spaces um, to adopt best practices. Okay, cool. Um, is there a way to tell who we shouldn't trust with our data? Oh, that's a good question. Um, who we shouldn't trust? Well, obviously, we shouldn't trust companies who are not able to explain and make visible what data they're collecting, why they're collecting it, and especially what are you getting in return for the data that is collected. You should probably not trust companies who repeatedly uh, lose your data in a breach um, and obviously don't safeguard the data. Honestly, it's sometimes it's hard to uh, see for at least consumers. It's different with B2B business partners. For consumers, it's sometimes hard to know exactly what's going on. Um, what we see is it's becoming much more apparent because nowadays, if you go to, onto any website, thanks to GDPR, you're suddenly realizing how much cookies, how much information is stored in your computer is exchanged. And I think that's eye-opening for a lot of people to just see what's actually going on in the background of ground data. You're just looking at an article and it's more than 2000 cookies being installed for this one article. Why is that? Okay, so last one question from my side. <laughs> How do you see data being used uh, du during um, Corona times? Oh, uh, also very good question because what we're seeing is obviously that the, the public at large, I mean, we've seen a lot around data recently, but I think looking at the daily infection rates, looking at um, growth rates around infections and death toll and so on has really made people aware of uh, data science about models. Everybody's seeing this on the news all the time. I think it's gonna give a big push to, to data scientists in society, in terms of citizen services and government. We'll give a big push to a lot of open data initiatives. And I think in one of the earlier talks, uh, we looked at the John Hopkins dashboard. I think that's a prime example of how you can make data visible to the public and to people and uh, show what's happening with the epidemic through data. Yeah, thank you so much, Jan. I'm always uh, amazed to work with people like Jan. <laughs> Big smile. <laughs> I guess, Dominic, <laughs> you, you are also like uh, yes, Jan is my direct supervisor, of course, one of the best bosses I ever had. Jan may not hear you, but um, yes, uh, Dominic. I trust you're saying good things. <laughs> yeah, he says, yeah, that's right. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. And um, looking forward to the next talks. Thank you so much. So thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. OK, welcome back. I think now we are switching from Jan to Jun. Yes. Um, <laughs> Um, my next um, guest now is um, from Norway. Um, his name is, I hope I, again, my pronunciation has to be correct, Jon André Locke. I hope it's right. Let's have a look. hear me? Is everything fine with you? I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Perfect. Everything is fine. So um, welcome uh, in our first digital conference. I would say the stage is yours now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good. So um, again, thank you very much for having us on this um, first I experience fully digital conference. I think it's it's a very interesting format, especially under the current conditions. This may not only be popular, but also very important going forward. So I think that's a great initiative. Let me quickly bring up uh, my presentation so that we can get started. I'll try to do as I have been instructed here. So 
I don't think I'll do like that. And are you happy with this? <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so my name is Jon André Lecke. That was a pretty good pronunciation you had there. I'm the CEO of Nell Hydrogen. Uh, we are a pure play uh, hydrogen technology company listed on the Oslo Stock Exchange. We have about 25,000 shareholders. Uh, we are the largest producer of equipment to produce green renewable hydrogen and, and also fueling stations. And our vision is empowering generations with clean energy forever. It's a big topic, it's a very important topic, and uh, I would like to share some thoughts with you related to that. So we believe that um, hydrogen will unlock the potentials of renewable. If you want to store, if you want to move large quantities of renewable, renewable energy, hydrogen is going to be key. If you want to do deep uh, decarbonization of mobility application, in particular heavy duty application, hydrogen is going to be key. And if you want to decarbonize a range of different industry applications, you actually do not have another choice. Hydrogen is going to be key. The cost is falling dramatically, and we believe now it's time to start to roll out these technologies. And I'm now, I will now try to uh, tell you all about it for the next few minutes. So, the simplest and most abundant element in the universe is hydrogen. 75% of the universe is actually made up of hydrogen. And we have hydrogen all uh, around us. Even the sun is powered by hydrogen. Uh, when hydrogen is fusioning into helium, um, the sun is basically creating all the heat and light that we so desperately need. The sun radiates energy and light and moves the wind and the water, which is essential for renewable energy sources that we can utilize here on Earth. And the Earth is also full of hydrogen. Most often, the water uh, is found in water where hydrogen is combined with oxygen into H2O. Uh, but hydrogen is also the core energy component into all of our fossil fuels. If you strip away the carbon and all the rest of it, hydrogen is actually what is carrying the energy in the oil, in the coal, and in the natural gas. And, and uh, so basically, if we can. If we can build, uh, if we can uh, create hydrogen in a renewable, sustainable way, we actually can decouple. We do not need the, the fossil sources anymore. So the question is, why have we not done it before? And um, what is holding us back? Um, well, before we go into that, um, it's worth noting that the market for hydrogen is already very, very large, as much as 70 million tons of hydrogen is produced every year, but 98% of this is actually from fossil sources, from coal, from oil, from uh, natural gas. Um, but it does not uh, need to be like that. We have all the energy we need when we harvest the wind and the sun, and this obviously comes on top of what we have been harvesting for decades and even centuries, namely hydropower. Um, and then we basically have to then go back to what we have done before, because we have done this before in large scale. This particular facility is a, it's a, re, it's a hydropowered, uh, renewable hydropower powered hydrogen production facility that we uh, as a company now built, owned and operated back in the day. So basically what we need to do now is that we need to do the same again. We just need to do it in a much, much bigger scale. Um, and then we will not have to rely on the fossil uh, sources anymore. The cost of renewables is going down dramatically. Um, this is the curve for wind and solar. And when uh, the cost of renewable energy constitutes 70 to 80% of the cost of renewable hydrogen, then when you have cheap renewable energy, you automatically have cheap renewable hydrogen. So this is basically the most important driver that we've seen over the last um, number of years. 
On top of that, hydrogen is also uh, solving another big issue. Uh, that is that renewable power is not a constant source of energy. It comes and goes. The sun doesn't always blow and the wind doesn't, uh, the, the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. So, so we need to have a way where we can actually uh, control that. And hydrogen is then the key. And what happens then when you turn electricity um, into hydrogen, you basically extend the lifetime of an electron from zero to eternity. You can actually uh, store as much, as much energy as you want, and you can move it to the location you want in the form of uh, renewable hydrogen. These trends are already being recognized around the world. Um, we see uh, financial markets increasingly starting to understand the importance of this, illustrated in this particular case by Bloomberg. We also see many of the largest industrial companies around the world are writing reports about this topic, here illustrated by uh, the Hydrogen Council. Um, you will be able to find this report online if you, if you Google uh, or search Hydrogen Council. A very um, good report. And that means that we can then, first of all, tackle 25% of the CO2 emissions, which comes from mo the mobility sector. And here we have been already working on these for the last 15 years. Uh, we've uh, made a lot of fueling stations for cars, uh, but are also have a significant or large contracts on, on, on equipment, production equipment for heavy duty uh, transportation. We're working with buses in, in different parts of the world. We're working also on trains, on, on, on material handling equipment. And most recently, we are also supporting um, um, mining, making, helping the mining, mining industry to become greener by basically running these huge mining dumpers on renewable energy, on, hydro, on uh, hydrogen, instead of running them on diesel. And since we are a Norwegian company and we're located in Norway, we also have a lot of uh, marine applications. So fast ferries, we're working on that. We're working on traditional ferries. And we're even working on uh, trying to decarbonize ships. Uh, in this uh, particular instance, we're talking about cruise ships. But over time, this will also be relevant for, for um, other types of shipping applications. So that's 25% of the CO2 emission. Another 25% of the CO2 emissions comes from a range of different industry applications, where in some cases you don't have another choice but to use uh, hydrogen. For example, for ammonia, you simply take your fossil hydrogen molecule, you replace it with a with a green molecule, and, and then you have green ammonia, you have green, green fertilizer. Same goes in the refinery. Instead of instead you just replace your fossil molecule with the green one. And the same with methanol. If you want to make CO2 free steel or CO2 free titanium, you can burn hydrogen instead of burning coal. You will then make water instead of making CO2. Same goes for the cement industry to some extent. You can actually replace some of the processes there with renewable hydrogen. You can make um, cement, which is, carries a less of a carbon footprint. If you want to power a remote island, or if you want to make the gas in your gas pipelines greener, you can replace some of the natural gas with, with, with renewable hydrogen. If you want to export uh, energy, you can use a green renewable hydrogen. And fish farming, obviously, uh, very relevant for Norway. I really wish that we could push that topic because, um, you know, we want to, we want, we, I would like to see the first completely CO2 free fish farm uh, being built uh, sooner rather than later here in, in Norway. So this is a, this is a big, um, a big uh, potential, obviously. Uh, we're talking about uh, 4,000 gigawatts is basically the market, the relevant market that we are, we are here addressing, uh, which I just talked about. And just to put that into perspective, the current market is 0 0.1 gigawatt. So we have a lot of work to do, uh, but that, uh, but you know, we have we have already started uh, working on on those on those topics. 
For example, here, this is our Gigawatt facility in Norway. We're constructing a very large facility to make electrolyzers. Here, um, the, the cost of this production facility will drop dramatically. And basically, we will be able to then enjoy uh, sell equipment to around the world um, uh, or for the world to, to start to utilize renewable hydrogen in a much bigger scale. We have already built a facility in Denmark. If you want to power your car or your, your, your bus or your uh, dumper or your truck uh, with uh, renewable hydrogen, here we can actually make three times the global demand for, for uh, fueling stations. Um, the total world market last year was 300 sta uh, 100 stations, and we can here make 300 stations per year. So we take this challenge very seriously. We do believe that we need to cut costs. We do believe that we need to scale up, uh, and, and that is basically what we're doing. And that means that we have um, a plan to cut things in half. What I presented to you now in the last few minutes has the potential to cut the global CO2 emissions by 50%, percent five zero percent um, And that is good news for, for, for you and me and everyone else on this earth. So with that, uh, I would like to share one other slogan uh, that we typically use to illustrate this. And we actually have this on the back of our hydrogen car. Um, Thank you for the right dinosaurs. We will take it from here. So with that, I can uh, I will shut this down and and open up for questions. If I can do that. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, thanks for the interesting uh, insights you gave us. Um, one of the first questions. Um, Maybe um, you ended with um, how much um, carbon we can uh, we can um, get rid of. Um, what's your personal vision, or more maybe your personal vision about how long will it take from your point of view uh, until um, renewable energy can um, take over um, existing ways to 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 use energy? Well, I mean. Uh Renewable energy is already cheaper in many areas compared to fossil. Um, so, so um, you know, we, it's now cheaper in many places around the world to build a wind park or a solar park instead of building a, a coal-fired power plant. So, so from that point of view, there isn't really there isn't really any need to stop. Now, on top of that, obviously, you 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 have the benefit of when you have a renewable plant, you know exactly the cost. And you know that for the next 20 years. So that's the beauty of building a solar plant or a wind farm. You know exactly the cost of your energy for the next 20 years. If you, if you build a natural gas-powered power plant or, or you're relying on oil price, you know how it is. It goes up and down all the time. It's very, not very predictable. So I think in many places around the world where the sun is shining and where the wind is blowing, this is already competitive. It's just a matter of executing and rolling out. And the same goes for our technology. We already have the technology uh, available to be able to roll this out in large scale. Um, there are huge salt caverns in Europe where you can store enormous amount of energy. You can actually store much, much more than the entire electricity demand for Europe um, uh, for one entire year. You can store in salt caverns, caverns uh, in Europe. So you already have these things um, in, in place. So it's more about, you know, Having the guts and the willingness to, to basically execute on these different uh, technologies and roll them out. Okay, thanks for the for the answer. Uh, we have uh, one question from the community. Alina Takova is asking: Do Norwegian shipyards utilize the renewable energy sources idea when designing new ships now? For example, Ulstein Werft. Yeah. So 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 I mean. If, uh, in general, we have you know 98, 99 percent renewable power in our grid here in Norway. So we are in an extremely fortunate position. We're having a lot of hydropower. So everyone, all the industry in Norway is already uh, primarily uh, driven by renewable power. But I think the question that she's asking is more related to whether these different shipbuilders and ship designers are working on new solutions 
that can where they can utilize for example green renewable hydrogen instead of diesel instead of oil and that the answer is yes they're all working very very hard on it uh, and the reason is because norway you know we've been all about making speciality ships supply ships for the oil and gas industry or or ships for extreme conditions you know explorer ships etc cetera, etc cetera. that's our niche um because the basic the, this mainstream ships you can build in korea you can build in other locations we have to kind of build what is technology advanced so when when this trend came up the norwegian shipbuilders and norwegian ship designers thought yes this is what we really need we want to go into this because this can give us a new competitive advantage we can now leave our compet competitors behind we can offer new solutions based on something green so i would say there is a lot of activity the first hydro power uh, hydrogen powered ferry is is uh, being rolled out relatively soon it's currently under construction and there will be more tenders coming out for ferries around the coast and there is also a long range of other initiatives related to fast ferries related to supply ships uh, etc etc thanks um, another one we have from andreas men him he's asking in which year were the first one gigawatt electrolyzer facility be built we are constructing it now as we speak and it should be done by the end of the year and we'll ramp it up in the beginning of next year i'm now uh, obviously assuming that the current situation with the whole coronavirus will will stay under uh, a relative control uh, and not consume all of the attention of the globe forever and ever but uh, our plan is to uh, build it this year, start it up towards the end of the year, beginning of next year. So, you know, this time next year, you can come and visit the first, um, the first gigawatt plant electrolyzer facility. You, you know that this, you said this live, so everyone will come now. <laughs> I've just been to Norway. It was really wonderful. I will come back. Um, yeah. so... We will invite the band, you know, so we can... <laughs> <laughs> we can um, have a party. Thank you very much. There was another question. Um, the question was, um, it's gone now, about uh, Benjamin Ackermann. Are there any news with Nicola? Well, if it was news uh, with uh, Nicola, um, the news would be uh, heard. Uh, no, I mean, we, we are working very closely with Nicola as we have. Um, they are great partners. We really admire them. Uh, we want to do whatever we can to support them. And I think that goes both ways. We have a, a big contract with them, as, as probably many of the listeners know, that we are working on. And, and, and um, there is a lot of uh, things, nitty gritty details related to the technical solutions, related to the speed of rollout of these stations, which needs to be agreed. And we just have to leave that to the technical team and the sourcing guys, so they can basically agree on all of those details. And when when they're ready, we will um, we will for sure come out and uh, tell more about it. Okay, great news. So, John, thank you very much for your time, for answering our questions. Um, we wish you a happy um, rest of the week, a happy weekend soon. Thank you and very much. Goodbye. Thank you. See you bye soon. Bye. Yeah, before we go on with our next speaker, I had actually a um, question after David Linderman's talk. Dominic, which game is your favorite one? Uh, who, who asked this? I am asking you. Oh, I'm I, currently, currently I'm, 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 I'm playing a, a mobile game. It's called Godus. It's uh, Godus. quite old and okay. you exactly, um, as it says, you, you play God. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> also good. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's cool. So my favorite uh, game is still Risiko. I'm not sure if uh, everyone out there knows it, but I love strategic games. So um, that is always uh, great to play. Dominic, yes? I'm afraid we are nearly done, but not I know yet. that you have a burner like in the end. Yes, as we already saw in the teaser at the beginning of uh, today's um event. Uh, our next guest is John Cohn, IBM Fellow from the United States. Let's have a look. Hey. Welcome. Mm, how are you? 
I am fine, hopefully you are too. Um, we are very much looking forward to hearing from you. You are talking about um, Big Blue meets Mars Green, a path toward green AI, am I right? Yes, that's exactly right. Wonderful, so the stage is yours, John. Oh, thank you very much, Dominic. I uh, just want to start by saying um, these are remarkable, crazy days, and I hope everyone out there is uh, doing well and staying safe. Um, I'll show you what I, I think this is all, always an opportunity to spend time thinking about something important, and this is what I've been thinking about. So um, what I'm going to talk about is, is um, some... Um, information about uh, a topic that's very close to my heart in terms of sustainability. And um, let me just introduce myself. Um, I am very much of a nerd. Um, I have, uh, I'm old and funny looking, and that has given me a very good perspective on, on how um, uh, technology evolves. As a matter of fact, this year, I will have been at IBM for 39 years. I want to introduce you to a couple of other people quickly because it, it will help me tell my story. Um, I've always been in, loved making things, and this talk is, is something about uh, insights from making things. But I want to introduce you to my late father-in-law, Gabe Mariano, who also was at IBM for 36 years. He spent his career making things like these giant robotic machines for making these giant mainframes, at, which are now like the data centers of today including our, our, our current Z series. He was, he was a love, uh, he loved making stuff all the time. And the thing that he made that I liked the most is my wife, Diane, who also worked at IBM. She worked at IBM for eight years. She's now a yoga teacher, which is very cool. But between us, we have 83 years of working for this company in this industry. And that's given me a pretty interesting perspective because I'm now on my fifth career, actually. I worked very long in the, uh, the design and, and fabrication of, of microcontrollers and microprocessors, including some of our biggest. Um, and then I went on to do several other things, including Internet of Things. Um, but in that, in that almost 40 years, I have seen so many things come and go. Uh, what's interesting in this next phase of my career, I want to introduce you to where I am now. I am very uh, uh, pleased and, and uh, honored to actually now be uh, uh, the IBM fellow at the MIT IBM Watson AI Lab. Um, this is a 10-year commitment that the IBM company has made to uh, work with MIT collaboratively on a number of topics. We, have, um, we are on campus and we actually are managing about 50 projects where our, our scientists and the MIT scientists work side by side, hand in hand, on topics including AI algorithms, uh, new physics, new materials for AI, AI applications to industry, and AI for shared prosperity around fairness, et cetera. Um, it's a fabulous uh, opportunity and it's, it's the backdrop for what I'm doing. It's been really cool for me because it's kind of like back to the future because I actually was a, uh, uh, went to MIT, oh my gosh, I graduated in, uh, I was there in the 70s and the 1980s. And so being back on campus is like a, a dream come true for me. Um, it's kind of interesting because it's a it's a great collaboration of, of you know, between uh, industry and academia, but it's kind of a long tradition that actually it's interesting because uh, our company and several others, Bell Labs, et cetera, worked with MIT back in the first times of the early days of, of AI. It actually started in 1956 was the first time the term artificial intelligence came out. And it was at a seminar that was organized by MIT and IBM. These people here were actually up. It, was, it actually took place in New Hampshire and they, they talked about the, the advent of artificial intelligence in 1956. What's interesting is you can tell which people on this, uh, I'd give you a second to guess, which are the people who are from IBM in this picture. They're the ones with the ties, which is very interesting to be in such a, a place with long traditions. But as I've said, I've, I've had a very long and, and fun, fun career, but this is the most exciting thing because learning AI, um, you know, I, I've, I've uh, actually the guy in the middle, this guy, Marvin Minsky's son was my college roommate. 
And when we were talking, you know, we would meet him back in the 70s and early 80s, he would talk about AI and it was always about to happen. Well, it's really happening now. And of my almost 40 years, this is the most incredible growth of a technology. There's always hype about a new technology, but it always is a little further out. What's so interesting is to see the uptake in, in artificial intelligence. And it was all done because uh, just a few years ago, uh, I think it was maybe 2000, uh, uh, 2012, 2015 kind of era, uh, we started to get the, enough computation resource in the terms of, of accelerated computing to actually make these neural networks work. If you look at how fast it's growing, this is a report from Forbes that it's actually going in the projection is just by 2025, which is just around the corner, it's going to be a, already a $35 billion, billion dollar business. And that's a big deal, right? Um, so this is this is actually a trend that's that's not just in the future. It's happening. If you look at the classes just at MIT, they've grown 5X. There's now waiting room, a waiting line to get into the intro AI courses. And, and uh, it's five times the demand that it was just three years ago. That's pretty incredible. So with that growth, I started thinking about this because when you, when you think about the growth in AI, I started to realize when I was doing AI uh, calcul, you know, um, starting to do AI work back at MIT, that it's very, it's very compute intensive. And if you actually look at some of these projections of how much computation is going to take of, of, of our world energy, and what that means is, unless we're careful, how it will directly impact climate, that is also pretty scary. Because by 30, uh, by 2030, it's looking that, that um, you know, that almost you know, over 20% of the energy in the world, well, some, some people say it might even be as high as 80%, but the, the low um, best estimate for how much IT will be using is over 20%. That's over 9,000 terawatts of energy. So if you see that the AI is growing like crazy and IT is growing like crazy, if we're not careful, we're going to end up causing more problem than we, you know, AI, I have, I'm such a, uh, I'm a technology realist. I tend to be on the optimistic side. You know, there are issues and stuff with AI. But it is going to do so much good, you know, for healthcare and and public safety. But the main thing we got to do is make sure that we don't harm the climate in the process. Now, to kind of put this into um, uh, uh, more uh, direct terms, it's getting increasingly costly to make AI models. So if you actually look at how um, evolution of AI is going, just over the last couple of years, you can see sort of, if you look into the energy consumption, what I really want to call your attention to is, as we start to get into the you know more recent times where people are making very huge models, uh, like the transformer model, which is a large not natural language processing model, um, especially when you're using, you're training all of these parameters in, in what's, you know, in a deep learning kind of sense, but you're also doing model tuning, you're doing net, uh, neural architecture search, that if you're not careful, you can start to spend a lot of money. Look at that. These are millions of dollars to train, uh, uh, to actually tune and train a very large model. Now, this is an extreme case, but all kinds of things that we use every day in terms of video recognition, audio recognition are getting extremely costly. But when you take that dollar amount and you transfer it into something that might, you know, we think about from climate, that's a huge amount. Those, those are in pounds of CO2. So it's tons and tons of CO2 just to train that single model. So if you want to put that in more human terms, um, this is kind of the, the carbon costs, uh, including that last big number. So if you take a round trip air, air flight from New York to San Francisco, that's that little red bar is about how much carbon you emit as prorated from you, know, you and everyone else on the plane. If you look at how much a year of human life uh, in the world, it's about you know eleven thousand pounds of CO two. If you look at American life, this is the poor, you know, maybe not the best statement of of our lifestyles because we tend to use more energy. It's at thirty six. You look at a car that as actually running a gasoline car that's running for a full lifetime. You see that amount. 
take that comparison that I just made about, you know, the energy costs and carbon costs of that large NLP model using neural architecture search. Look at that. Now, if you just think about that and how many of these models are going to be trained all over the world, you know, we've got a problem. We've got a potential problem. So I want to introduce you to something that is, um, uh, you know, what can we start to do about it? And I, th this all came together because when I moved to MIT, I realized that there's just an un insatiable need for compute, a special kind of compute, accelerated compute. So I started working on a project called Satori. Satori is a mid-sized uh, supercomputer that IBM has, uh, has built for MIT. It's a uh, 64 AC922 Power AI processors. There's lots of cool numbers in there. Each node has a terabyte of memory. It has uh, 2.3 petabytes of storage. It, uh, uh, it is a, roughly a two petaflop machine, which just a few years ago would have been the fastest computer in the world. Right now, it's kind of midway between the top 500 computers, but it, it has got some really special characteristics. First of all, I gotta say, the name Satori, people ask me about, well, why'd you call it Satori? Well, because Satori is a Zen, Japanese Zen Buddhist word for sudden enlightenment, but actually Satori is the name of our very cute dog. And, uh, I was like, oh, well, uh, we were all having a meeting and my boss said, he said, oh, that's a cute dog. I said, what's her name? And I said, Satori. And he goes, let's name it that. So I guess there's a, you know, it's nice when your company issues you a wife and it's nice when they name your supercomputers after your pets. But this is a really special machine because this, this machine is um, incredibly energy efficient. When we turned it on last October, we worked like everyone does when you build a supercomputer, you run a bunch of tests to see how it performs. And we were happy to see it, it performing just around two petaflops of machine, uh, uh, you know, which, which makes it comfortably in the top 500. But what we found out, we were very pleased to find out that it was the number four on the green 500 list. This is the number, this is the, um, the listing of the top 500 supercomputers in the world listed by their energy efficiency. We are the number four. And what's interesting, uh, just kind of pointing this out, of the top five, uh, the one before us and the one after us and us, so this is Satori here at the bottom of the yellow group, um, but those are all based on the same IBM Power AI architecture. So this is an incredibly green machine, which means only that it's incredibly, it's very, very efficient for converting electrical energy into ones and zeros, which are absolutely key for AI. And this machine is geared because it has 260 V100 GPUs. It's geared specifically for AI. Now, what actually makes it remarkable is not only is it an efficient machine, but it's based at the Mass Green High Performance Compute Center in Holyoke, Massachusetts. This is a, you know, may not look like a, a fascinating building, but it's on an old warehouse site in Holyoke, Massachusetts, which used to be uh, for manufacturing things like silk and, and spinning wool. But this was rebuilt as a, a brownfield site, and it is the most energy efficient uh, compute center in the world, as far as we know. It's 97% green and renewable energy. And as a matter of fact, it actually has just off to the corner of this, this uh, there's a, a water power generator that dates from the, the late 19th century that has still been maintained um, with new generator, of course, but it actually puts out about 200,000 watts, which is about what Satori is doing on an average day. So it's actually running on local water power if you wanna count the electrons that way. But this green data center, because it purchases all green energy, the combination of that and Satori's you know, mechanical uh, efficiency makes it really, really remarkable platform. So let me just make a co comparison that if we ran the benchmarking software that we used to sort of characterize Satori for a year. So in other words, we ran for a high load all year. Um, that would be the carbon equivalent at a normal data center, just of just running the normal load of about 280 large maple trees. I'm from Vermont, so I gotta put everything in terms of maple trees. So just running that computer is 280 trees. That's a lot. If you run it on Satori, in this data center. So that's what would happen if you ran it, uh, you know, uh, uh, that kind of workload at another place. If you run it 
in in Satori in in um, this data center, we're only burning four trees. Think about that. That's seventy times better. So the idea of being able to make a machine, build it right, put it in the right place, that starts to actually help, you know address what you're going to what we can do to kind of fix this this energy problem. But what really makes this important is that in Satori, when anyone runs, we make it very, very easy to determine how much power you're using. And the reason that's important, because as much as making green data centers and green computers is important, what we really need to do is change the way that we do AI software. And I want to tell you about that because we've gotten so excited about this because we, we saw like 70 times. That's huge. So we started to actually talk to students and, and, and researchers about how can they make their AI greener? And by giving them an easy way to get feedback of the power, um, we found incredible stuff. So this was, we ran a hackathon the other day. And this is my friend, Dr. Mohammed Haverian, and he, he's uh, doing research on um, uh, coronary artery disease. So they're, they're putting um, ultrasound down, you know, arteries to kind of look at arterial sclerosis. And during the course of this hackathon, be, just simply because giving people feedback of how much power they're using, we were a, he was able to, uh, Dr. Haveri, uh, Haft Haverian was able to look at a bunch of parameters that you never looked at before. So if you're just concerned about accuracy, you know, you'll just throw everything at it. But there's a certain amount of accuracy you don't need. And what we found by actually improving utilization and refining the model and doing these experiments with this direct feedback of how much power, you can tell that he could that he was actually able to not only save time but lower the energy and you know be able to choose an acceptable amount of accuracy it turns out that you know you can spend over you can spend almost three times the energy and get hardly usable you know an insignificant amount more more accuracy so all you need to do is give that that insight back i'll give you one more example um my good friends in professor song han's lab they're a, a group that's looking specifically at how to optimize um, AI models on constrained hardware, like, for example, telephones, et cetera. And it turns out that these trainings, these are the same carbon costs that I mentioned before. And you see that very, very large cost of, of this uh, transformer uh, natural language model. Well, Dr. Uh, Professor Han's team has actually been looking at that by looking on Satori, looking at the measurements of power, and instead of taking the conventional, when you do natural language process, you need to look at the words that are, you know, this is like trying to understand some, uh, you know, someone who's speaking. You have to look at the words that are close by, you know, to get context. And then you have to kind of look at the overall, like almost at a sentence structure. So the way that the, the AI model is constructed to sort of do what's called the attention model in this expensive model, what uh, Professor Han and team did is they they used this long and short range attention model that changed the fundamentals of how you look at attention. And in that incredibly large model, they were actually able through this mechanism and, and a couple of other simple tricks to take the, the same the, this um, same natural language process uh, and get better or pretty close to the same accuracy at, at, at almost 1 20,000th, 1 20,000th of the energy and carbon. So all that's key is to be able to make people aware, give them insight about the carbon costs. And we believe that this will start to change people's thinking and move towards more energy efficient, more responsible AI. So I'm, um, you know, that's, you know, it's really just a matter of breathing awareness into people who are writing this software. So in summary, I just wanna say that if, if we don't take action, AI may soon become a climate issue. I mean, it really does look like it could, but I think that there's several ways that we can fix it. One is to build you know, greener computers and put them in greener places. That we should be doing because that also saves energy, which saves money. But I believe that actually just being able to give people energy and carbon feedback on the, what they're running can motivate huge energy innovations and really stop this crisis before it, it comes. And I think we can together, if we, if we work between hardware people, software people, uh, climate people, we can actually do something much better. And even though this is incredibly serious topic, and these are incredibly serious times, I mean, unprecedented, it, whatever happens, 
you know, it doesn't pay to, to have a culture of worry. And I want to leave you with one thing. So this picture here, uh, one of the, the wonderful things that I get to do at the uh, MIT AI Lab is I like to tell people about the wonders of AI and what it can do and sometimes what it can't do. So I would like to share with you a, a toy that we made that is actually very geared towards this. This is actually an AI model that will run on your phone. And if you go to ibm.biz slash Veriman or look at that QR code, you can download this. It's a, it's a visual theremin that allows you to make somewhat beautiful music by waving your hands around. And it is an example of an AI model that has been so optimized that it can run in the simple hardware of your phone. So go check it out, ibm.biz slash Veriman, and uh, let me know if you enjoy it. Thank you very much. It was very impressive to see all those those insights. I am. Um, it was very very funny that you made the the red circle on the last chart. You know, because I even didn't realize in the beginning that there even was some kind of it, different it's color. It's almost so small. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that would be my first question. So obviously there is a solution to um, use some kind of green AI instead of old fashioned AI. So what's what's stopping it from from being rolled out? Well, the funny thing is nothing's really stopping it, Dominique, but what, what actually is the case is that no one ever gets feedback about the energy trade-offs. Now you get direct feedback of um, how long something takes, which is a, a reasonable proxy, but not a great proxy for how much energy it takes, but you never get direct feedback. And if you get sort of almost an emotional connection, when I start telling you that how many maple trees that took, you start going, hmm. And it's interesting because you don't want to green shame, you know, you don't want to make somebody feel bad for doing something they have to do. But if you give them a feedback that this approach versus that approach, I still get the same accuracy, but I can save energy. On this hackathon we had, we were able to, you know, I, I could only pick one, uh, one or two instances to show you, but people were able to find four, five X without looking. And all it took was feedback. So it's just like now we're starting to get, like when you take an airline flight, you get the carbon cost. If you never thought about it before, you would never, it'd never be in your consciousness. So nothing is stopping it. More about, it's more about awareness and feedback. We have one question. Uh, one colleague of us is asking what kind of songs you can play with the uh, Veriman um, experiment. Yeah. <laughs> I hope that that was that was a funny thing to add at the end, but it <laughs> yes, is it was. an example of it's example. It's an example of optimizing AI models to run in very constrained platforms like a telephone. And you can play. I've never heard anyone play it beautifully, but the mm. nice thing is it's it's for those of you who are music people, it's actually a MIDI instrument. So I can you can run it to a keyboard. Uh, I have a Tesla coil that plays music that you can play. Uh, and I would I would challenge anyone to try to go make beautiful music. It's certainly fun. Just try it on your phone. I will try. The first thing I will try after this session is I will look up a German equivalent of the maple tree because um, <laughs> I have to find out <laughs> what. Keine uh, Ahnung. You sag man maple auf Deutsch. Ahorn. Graben oder? Ahorn. Ahorn, okay. Ahorn, ah, genau. Ahorn. So, okay. I wasn't sure about it. Okay, John, um, it was a pleasure to have you with us. Um, thank you very much for, for your impressions and um, have a nice day and stay healthy. You too. Stay healthy, everyone. Goodbye. Yes, bye bye. That was it. And that was it. Our very first digital conference. Um, let's say it's a wrap. <laughs> we had four hours, 11 speakers. Thanks, thanks to all of our speakers. Thank you all out there to, to the audience. Uh, we hope you had a great time with us together. We for sure had. And um, yeah. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your time. Stay healthy. Um, stay away from others. And see you at the next I Experience Friday. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs>